Welcome back, everyone. Can you see me and hear me? If you guys can let me know. Welcome, Alonzo. I can see your name. Welcome, Guy. Welcome, Balwinder. Um, welcome, 4D Robotics. Nick, welcome. Okay, it looks like everybody's starting to pop in now. Looks like they're about 40, then it uh, looks like people are coming in. Ian, welcome. Derek, so good to see you. Windhowlers. Um, Caesar, welcome. Welcome, everyone, to day two of our AWS Advanced Networking Free Boot Camp. Um, I'm Michael Gibbs, and I'll be your instructor today. Um, most of you guys already know me because it's day two of the boot camp, but because it's day two and people are, are, are coming in, uh, possibly as new viewers, we want everybody to know this is the second day of the Go Cloud Architects AWS Advanced Networking Boot Camp. We're very happy to have you all here. Today we're going to continue the discussion of AWS Advanced Networking Concepts. For those of you that are not familiar with me, I've been working in technology for well over 25 years and I've been helping people start their first tech career for over two decades now. My name is Michael Gibbs. I'm the founder and CEO of Go Cloud Architects. I've been a Cisco certified internet expert for over 20 years now. So I've been involved in the networking world for a very long time. I worked for WorldCom, which is now Verizon. I worked for Cabletron, which is now Nokia. I was the lead architect for the backbone design at Comcast. I was the lead architect for the voice network at one of the world's largest banks. And I worked for Cisco Systems as well. So I've been in this field for a long time. And we discuss networking. Wow, it's fun. And I love talking about it. <clears throat> so welcome, everyone. We're going to kick off today's discussion with BGP training. Because, you know, BGP training is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we did VPN yesterday, v BGP yesterday. Today we're going to start talking about B VPNs. And then after we talk about VPNs, we're going to talk about ways to create large-scale connections to the cloud and do it with high-performance environments. So let's begin our discussion with VPNs. First and foremost, what is a VPN or a virtual private network? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. A virtual private network is any time you take a public network and you secure something and make it private. <clears throat> and there's a lot of different VPN technologies. They are not new. Now, predominantly, when we talk about virtual private networks or VPNs, we're typically speaking about IPsec encryption. And we'll talk a lot more about that, but there are multiple kinds of VPNs. A VPN is just a way to basically create a secure environment over a public shared network. So we'll talk a little bit about some of these technologies. IPsec tunnels, realistically speaking, are the majority of what we're going to be working with, which we're going to be talking about. But there are L2TP tunnels. There are RFC 2547 MPLS BGP VPNs that I worked with quite a lot. There was Frame Relay. There is ATM. There is VPLS. There are an incredible number of ways to basically secure private network connectivity over a public shared network, including VLAN. So all of this concept is a VPN. But when we're going to talk about VPNs in the context of AWS, we're going to be discussing IPsec tunnels or IP security. <clears throat> so why are we even dealing with VPNs in the first place? Why can't we just send our data over the internet? It's there. It works. It's pre-built. Well, Lots of reasons. First and foremost is going to be security. So the internet is public. And what I mean by public is once your data is on the internet, it can be seen by anybody. So the internet is public, so it is inherently very insecure. Um, with every passing day, it gets less secure. So you can't send proprietary information on the internet because people can see it, steal your proprietary information, and do something with it. So can't you need for security. To, to make it private. But that's not enough. What about routing? Internet routers, big core routers, the kind of stuff that I'm used to dealing with where you're taking, you're, you're, you're exchanging full routing information via BGP to your internet service provider, that's about a three quarters of a million routes plus per internet service provider. 
So if you're going to connect to 10 different internet service providers, you're going to be getting that routing information from 10 different people. So your routers are going to have to maintain, it's like a database, and it's a routing information base. It's going to include the network layer reachability information from it received from everybody else. So granted, if we wanted to do everything on the internet, first, everybody would need public IP addresses, and everybody would need these big internet routers. And that would mean every router that everybody would use in every branch office or campus office would be these several hundred thousand dollar routers, which obviously wouldn't scale. So security and then routing. Now, it's not just routing. With the internet, all the routing that you're using is BGP because that's what it's designed for. But internal to your organizations, people are using an interior gateway protocol such as OSPF or Open Shortest Path First. And the reason organizations need to use these routing things internally is they need speed. You know, BGP is designed for performance, meaning scalability, but also tunability, but it is not designed for speed. So if you've got your internal network and you're doing BGP as your primary network, which you really couldn't because you needed IGP to promote reachability of your IBGP peers anyway, what's really going on there is, you know, you, the BGP might take a minute to recognize a failure and change things, whereas OSPF can do it in seconds. So internally, Organizations are using, um, they need the routing, and they couldn't do the routing that they would need to over the internet. So why do organizations use VPNs? First, security, and secondly, routing. <clears throat> now the third is address space. You can't use public I or private IP addresses on the internet. So if you're using IPsec or GRE or some kind of tunneling protocol, you can tunnel your private IP addresses through the tunnel over the public internet, that works. But you can't do that where well, you can't have private addresses unless they're tunneled over the internet, which means we're out of addresses. We don't have anywhere near enough addresses to deal with every device in the entire world, which is fine because we're all using these RFC 1918 private IP address spaces. Perfect. But with the internet, we can't do that unless we're tunneling. So why do we use VPNs? Security, routing, the careful use of address space. And the other side of it is the other part of the routing. Typically speaking with routing, if you've got an OSPF, two OSPF neighbors, they need to be on the same subnet. And you're not really going to be able to do that kind of thing across the internet unless you put it through a tunnel because you're going to be on different subnets. That's the reason why you're using a VPN. So it's the routing, the security, the address base, and all that's necessary to make things work. That's the other reasons why you can't just use the internet. So what does this stuff actually look like when all is said and done? Let me give you an example. Um, so in this particular environment, let's say you've got your, <coughs> your data center, <coughs> you've got your cloud, you're both basically connecting both to the internet, and over the internet you're going to create an IPsec tunnel and secure your traffic. And that's it. That's how your VPNs work over the internet. No big deal. <coughs> So let's talk about IPsec VPNs, because these are the VPNs that you're going to be dealing with. <coughs> so <coughs> IPsec, or IP security, is a protocol suite, meaning it's got more than one protocol, and it's designed to basically secure private traffic over a public network. And you know what? If you had a private connection and wanted to increase its security, you could run IPsec over that private connection too. It doesn't just have to be over a public network. IPsec is used for a lot of the reasons, but it provides really good security. Like I mentioned, it enables you to tunnel your routing information over the internet and private IP addresses. All good. But it does a lot more than that. IPsec gives you tremendous security benefits, and that's why some organizations even use it over private lines. IPsec provides the following. Encryption, meaning if I send data to somebody else, between me and the somebody else, if anybody sees the message, they don't have the decryption key because they're, they can't view it. So it provides privacy by, through encryption. But it provides much more than that. That's, encryption is only a piece of the IPsec puzzle. Some of the really critical things they're doing are authentication of the peer. I see Alonzo's over here on this call. If I wanted to speak to Alonzo, I call Alonzo on the phone. If Alonzo picks up, I'm going to authenticate him by listening to his voice. I know what Alonzo's voice sounds like. I might ask Alonzo a couple questions. I know Alonzo pretty well. 
So I know the kind of answer is going to give me. And in the end, I can authenticate him. I know he's him. But on the internet, you know, you're not necessarily going to be able to authenticate people very easily. And IPsec does that. IPsec provides authentication of the peer. For example, what if I was trying to talk to Alonzo? And I was giving Alonzo really important secret information. But what if Alonzo wasn't Alonzo? It was somebody else pretending to be Alonzo. Well, that would be a problem. So when we start dealing with espionage, there's this term, the man in the middle attack. And where this comes from is you would have two bad guys, like bad guy A and bad guy B. And what would be going on in their life, you know, so this guy is trying to sell trade secrets to this bad guy. And let's see, we got bad guy A and bad guy B. And now what a, sc a, sc a spy would do is they'd try and pretend to be bad guy B. So that bad guy A would be talking to the spy instead of bad guy B. That's where these man-in-the-middle attacks come from. They come from the espionage world. Well, guess what? Who uses espionage tactics? Hackers. Hackers use spy tools. So they do man-in-the-middle attacks. They try to pretend to be the person you're communicating. But guess what? With IPsec, not a problem because IPsec provides authentication of the peer. So you can verify the source and the recipient. So what great stuff are we getting from IPsec so far? We are getting encryption to basically mean the data is useless unless you have the decryption key. And we can verify who's in the source and the destination. Now, message integrity is next. <coughs> what is message integrity? It means the message has not been changed. What if Ian was a patient of mine? He's not. But what if Ian on the call was a patient of mine? And what if Ian had high blood pressure? And I wanted to say, Ian, I'm going to give you catapress 0.1 micrograms every night as a doctor, because doctors use medical networks too, and I used to practice medicine before I went into tech 25 years ago. If I want to prescribe 0.1 micrograms of a drug to Ian, but somebody intercepted that message and changed it from 0.1 to one or 10 or 100 or 1,000, Ian could die, which would be horrible. So IPsec provides message integrity. <clears throat> this means you can verify that the message has not been changed since it left the source to the destination. Some really great stuff coming from IPsec. The last thing that IPsec provides is something called non-repudiation. If I send a message to Ian, there's a record of it. There's a, and it, it's not like Ian can basically say after the fact, he didn't receive it because, or I didn't, I can't say I didn't send it because there's a receipt. So let's talk about the great stuff provided by IPsec. Encryption, which basically makes your traffic unusable to anybody without the decryption key. Peer authentication, prevention of man in the middle attacks. I can verify that Alonzo was on the opposite side. Message integrity, IPsec uses a hashing algorithm. It uses a one-way mathematical hash. And by using a one-way mathematical hash, we can verify that nothing has changed. So if I send a message to Ian, basically what's going on is the message that Ian receives will be the message that I sent. And then non-repudiation, if I was sending that message to Ian, I can't say after the fact that I didn't send it. So these are the cool things provided by VPNs, and specifically IPsec-based VPNs. So when we're talking about VPNs, we're talking about using the internet or a public network to basically create our private tunneling and our private training. <coughs> our private means to communicate. So what makes VPN so great? Well, if you have internet access, you can have a VPN. All you need is internet access. How long does it take to get internet access? You probably already have it. So VPN, the advantage is they can be set up in minutes as soon as you have, um, what do you call it, as soon as you have internet access. Whereas if you were going to get a direct connection or a private line, which we'll talk about later, that takes time. It takes a lot of time. Why does it take a lot of time? You've got to call the service provider. They've got to provision things. They've got to bring trucks around. There's all kinds of things that goes along. So VPNs, minutes, um, it could take a month to set up a private line. So understand, you know, VPNs have some advantages. Where else are VPNs great? Imagine multi-site. Let's say you've got one environment and you want to connect to 50 locations and you've got a big internet pipe, you can set them all up quickly. It's not like you have to buy 50 different um, WAN connections with a direct connection. So VPNs, cheap, fast, easy to use. Now let's talk about why VPNs are not great and why you can't use them in a lot of cases. Performance. <coughs> let's face it, internet performance is not consistent. In fact, it's best effort. There is no guarantee that the internet will deliver your traffic, which means your 10 gigabit link might be 10 gigs 
It might be one gig, it might be down. It doesn't, there's no guarantee what happens to your traffic. So when you need guaranteed performance, you can never use the internet. Remember that, internet is best effort. Now there's some ways with software defined networking and some other things you can get much better performance on the internet. Excuse my, I'm a little bit of allergies. I have this really beautiful cat that I'm highly allergic to that I play with too much. But, so bear with me a little bit on the allergies and the sniffling today. So, something to pay attention to that uh, the internet performance is not consistent. So that means your bandwidth is not consistent, but also more importantly, it also means that your latency is not consistent. What do I mean by latency? The time it takes to get from point A to point B. Certain applications do not tolerate variations in latency. Variations in latency are called jitter. Video and voice applications are horrible with jitter. Certain financial applications are horrible with jitter. Jitter is variations in latency. So when you're using a VPN because the internet's performance is not guaranteed, you will have latency variations. Can your application tolerate it? I don't know. It's based upon the application as the architect you need to know. If your applications need consistent latency, you cannot use a VPN. You must use a private line or a direct connection. <coughs> so understand that. Also understand with regards to internet routing, you could cross multiple internet service providers or autonomous systems to get to your goal, destination. You know, in a private line, it's one hop. Or at least it looks like it's one hop to you. Across the internet, it might be five internet service providers and 20 hops. And there's really no guarantee your traffic gets there anyway. So understand, VPNs, performance could be questionable. Latency and bandwidth, not guaranteed. So why are you using them? It's fast. It's cheap. What, when can you use them? When, performance is, when guaranteed performance is not required when you're trying to save money. Guaranteed performance is required, you're not using a VPN. So, let's talk about VPNs when you're using the AWS. When you're using a VPN with AWS, it's because you're going to connect your data center to your VPC. And you're going to set up this site-to-site -site VPN. What is a site-to-site -site 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 VPN? When you connect one location to another location. That is site, it's a site VPN. In August, and I see of questions, we'll get to questions in a few minutes. We always do the four amount of 20 minutes of lecture, 10 minutes of questions. So we'll get to them in a few minutes. Chris is also taking notes of the questions. So, when you're setting up these AWS VPNs, it's a site to site VPN. Of course, you could set up multi, multi site VPNs too. And we'll talk about that later with Cloud Hub, where we'll basically take about multiple remote locations and connect them to your organization with multi site VPNs. But the point is, the way these things work is you create, there's an endpoint that's effectively on both sides, so, and everything goes into the endpoint, which is the tunnel, and everything gets encrypted through the tunnel. So that's how these things work. We'll start drawing them out and show you. So when you're setting up an IPsec tunnel, you typically have the following thing. What goes on is there's this Internet Key Exchange Association. And with that, in the, when you first set up the, the tunnel, you exchange keys on both sides. And when you're doing this, the encryption type is determined, the encryption algorithm is determined, and that's how you determine all the things for your tunnel. Now, having said all of this, if um, when you're setting up your tunnels, you can do static routing. What is the static route? IP route this subnet to this next top, you put it in there. Or you can use dynamic routing like BGP. Dynamic routing will automatically lose, learn routes and remove routes whether they're there or not. A static route is this. I want to go to Chris's house. I plan my route. I say drive on I-95 North and make a left and go west to wherever he lives. That's a static route. It does not change. A dynamic route is like my GPS. I get in my car and I go to Chris's house. On the way to get to my first stop sign, the road's blocked, my GPS reroutes me. That's what dynamic routing protocols do and that's why we typically recommend using something like BGP should you know how these things work. Now, when you're dealing with VPNs and you're dealing in network with networking in general, realistically speaking, what's going on is one is none, two is one, and three is better than two. So what do I mean by that? It means that you can never just have a single VPN. You're always going to need a backup. So when you're dealing with AWS, they're going to tell you their VPN gateway is a highly developable device. What do they mean by that? It's redundant. 
So when you set up your VPN with AWS, what's actually going on is it's going to set up a, an endpoint to terminate it in two availability zones. Remember, these aren't real routers, they're logical routers, so they're going to be around when you need them or not. And it's going to create you, you a VPN tunnel to two AZs. And that way, if a single availability zone were to go down, you'll still have network connectivity, which is pretty good. <clears throat> now, when you're setting up your VPNs, you can set them up as basically active-active or active-passive. And so what's going on with active-passive is you've got a primary VPN that's up, and the other one is down waiting for you to go. Or you can set it up as active-active, meaning you could have... You could be using your VPN directly to one availability zone and another availability zone. You will get much better performance this way, um, but you're going to have to basically just set up your BGP policy to make sure you don't get asymmetric routing. We'll talk a lot about how to do that. So does everybody understand the concept of the, VP, of the VPN so far? Because we've spent about 20 minutes talking about VPNs, and then we're going to spend about 20 more minutes talking about the VPNs, and we're going to talk about, you know, direct connections and all these other great things yet. But before we go any further, I want to make sure that there's no questions. So we've been speaking for about 20 minutes. It's time for about 10 minutes of questions. So let's look, look through the question list. So the first question from Augustin. Hey, Mike does a cloud architect does need to know on a knowledge on public IP private site or subnet and a network and host ID. Um, Augustine, it will be impossible to be a cloud architect without not that knowledge. That knowledge, specifically the knowledge of public address, private IP address, subnet mask, access control list, packet filtering, route summarization, BGP policy, um, NAT, um, BGP peering. VPC pairing and all these things would be minimum entry-level practice for any cloud architect. So this is just not a cloud network architect. What we're actually talking about here, Augustine, I know it's under the auspices of AWS Advanced Networking, but for network engineers and architects like me, this is really, this is like still barely getting into introduction to networking. So this level of networking knowledge is going to be critical for every single person that's going to want to work as a cloud architect, what we're teaching here. Minimum, minimum, minimum level. Because the cloud is nothing more than a virtualized network in a data center. So if you're going to go from the cloud to the data center, you're going to have to have that kind of knowledge, minimum. Donald, yes, the videos will be later. Um, Gopal, no. what happens if the TTL is zero? Um, if the TTL is zero, the packet will be dropped um, to prevent routing loops. <coughs> Naveed, hey Mike, can we have a site to site VPN between two VPC hosted and two different AWS accounts? Um, could you create two VP two two IPsec tunnels to two different accounts? Of course you could. Um, but then you'd be creating two separate IPsec tunnels. So percent, I need to, depending upon your network engineering background, it depends. I will tell you, most of the good cloud architects that I know that have distinguished and principal and senior level positions working in the cloud all come from a networking background. Now, having said that, there's network engineering backgrounds where you're designing systems for global organizations and you're dealing with BGP on a daily basis, and BGP tuning on a daily basis, and you're dealing with some really creative routing on a daily basis. These kinds of traffic engineering positions are the kind of network engineering work that things done. That some network engineers are basically configuring routers, basically turning on, putting an IP address on them, doing a no shut on an interface, and basically doing configuration. That's that level of network engineering skills isn't is appropriate for cloud engineering, but not cloud architecture jobs. If you're asking about cloud architecture jobs, it's really a knowledge of exactly all the systems in the network and the security systems like firewalls and VPN concentrators, as well as data center technologies, which include things like load balancers, server virtualization, container management, as well as understanding the file systems, block storage, object storage, file storage, 
understanding uh, not just IPsec encryption, but all the other security things, firewalls, uh, IDS, IPS systems. So those are the kind of things. And uh, I think coming from network engineering to the cloud is fantastic. I've done it. Uh, not only have I done it, I know many, many people that have done it, and they're all doing wonderful, wonderful, wonderful on the cloud. So the answer is absolutely. Um, I think you can do it. Now, we have a transition program where we take people and we teach cloud architects, people how to become cloud architects from scratch. And realistically speaking, that's based upon our 25 years experience in teaching people how to, uh, or 20 years experience in helping people get their first tech job, but also being an architect. I've worked as an architect for 25 years, both as a network architect, um, a cloud architect, an enterprise architect. I've worked as them all. Um, so in the process of doing that, you know, we developed an architecture training program. I dropped a link for that architecture training program below. And if you've got questions on how to make this transition, you want to call our office. We've listed our phone number for you as well. We help people make these transitions every single day. So yeah, if you're looking to move to an architecture role, you're going to need those technical skills, but you're also going to need the business acumen to do ROI modeling. You're going to need executive presence training. You're going to need presentation training. You're going to need uh, architect writing training and those things, and we train all of those things. So that would be my recommendation for you. You train that with us, or you could buy an emotion, emotional intelligence training course, presentation training course, writing training course, do the kind of business acumen RO modeling you would be doing in an MBA program, and then really spend the time to learn the data center technologies if you're coming from the networking world. And if you're a network engineer and you're not familiar with BGP, get real familiar with BGP because you're going to be using it everywhere. If you've got more questions, we can answer them on the next break, or you can call us and reach our office, or it's completely covered in our training program. I actually, um, no, I typed our phone number correctly. Uh, so GoPal, what happens is when the TTL becomes zero, the packet is dropped and thrown away. Mm -hmm. So Lamit Shah, is there a better source locker to learn about BGP and CIDR? Well, they are way, way, way on the opposite sides of the world. So I have a BGP paper that's going to be coming out next week that is going to explain pretty much everything that the cloud architect and engineers need to know about BGP. <coughs> now, CIDR. CIDR is a totally different story. CIDR is, so, so BGP you could consider advanced routing. CIDR would be introduction to basically junior level networking. And the reason I say this is, the CIDR stuff would be not ever included in BGP. The CIDR stuff would be included to the pre-CCNA work. Like how does, uh, for example, um, so for example, how does, uh, uh, how do you subnet? And typically speaking, that's taught long, long, long before people ever would have touched networking training because you can't do any networking without it. So after day one of this course, uh, what I learned was a lot of people do not understand subnetting. And since a lot of people do not understand subnetting, people asked me last week to do some subnetting training or on Monday. So if you guys want me to do some subnetting training and basically do a live course where we spend, you know, three to six hours and do subnetting training, put subnet training um, below, we'll actually do it, call it cloud arch type cloud architect subnet training. And if that's what you want, I will produce a couple hour live stream and we'll do a, we'll have a fun subnetting party. So if you want that, type Cloud Architect Subnet Training below and I'll do it. And then the last question I see from Derek. Derek says, when setting up, you stated there are two routes for redundancy. Okay, so what ultimately goes on, what, what's going on there is it's creating two automatic IPsec tunnels and so basically you create your tunnel to them to their gateway and then what ultimately happens is after you created the tunnel to the gateway they create two more virtual tunnels to two different availability zones so by doing that it's creating two paths for you so if you guys want some subnetting training let me know with the subnetting training and if you guys are liking the free training, if you can leave a like to the video, it helps improve our ranking. So we could use any help we can get. So thank you. So let me know about the Cloud Architect subnet training. If we, there's 80 some people on the call. If we get more than 50, I will reserve five hours in the next couple of weeks and we will do some subnet training completely free on YouTube.
Okay, so let's go back to some training. And if I missed any questions, um, please let please paste them again. Chris Johnson will be collecting these questions, and he will basically let me know. So let's get back to some training. So so let's look architecturally speaking at what we're talking about when I said that two IPsec tunnels are actually created when you create a VPN to AWS. So you've got your data center, we've got a router that we've used, and this is not a Cisco router symbol, we use one of the like AWS type router symbols. And you can see that what's going on is we're create what's being created is a VPN tunnel to two different availability zones. And this way your single IPsec tunnel can be related to two different availability zones. So that's how you're getting a highly available VPN. Now having said all that, look in the data center. See this router that you're originating? That's a single point of failure. So just because AWS says it's a highly available router doesn't mean it's highly available on your side. So understand that. So you may need, so one VPN is not going to be good enough. Because if you're doing a VPN and you're, you're counting on the second VPN tunnel to work, if you lose your internet connection on the data center side, or you lose the router on the data center side, as specified by this little orange thing where it says corporate data center, your systems are down. So don't count on it. Just realize that you do get two backups. So it's better than a single one, but it's not good enough. Now, when you're dealing with BGP, and you're dealing with two equal cost paths, it's very possible to send your data out one path and have it come back on another path, which in the grand scheme of things, all things being equal, if the latency and the path on one link was identical to the latency and the path on the other link, we'd be fine. But imagine it this way. Imagine I send my traffic on one highway and my traffic comes back on another highway some of the time. That means, you know, my traffic, if it's coming back from two different highways, could arrive out of order and I could have all kinds of problems. So when you're using BGP for routing, you either have to basically block one path or have one path be the preferred for some information and have the other path preferred for the other one. And that way you're not sending your data out one highway and coming back another highway because that becomes problematic. Because when you're load sharing across multiple highways and your traffic comes in out of order, what happens is your applications can work, your data can arrive improperly. So what AWS would say is just block one path. Having said that, don't just block one path. Load share your path. But on these VPNs, block one path. And how would you block one path if you're going to use BGP? Basically speaking, what you would do is you would make one metric lower than the other for the same route. And if you were to make one metric lower for the same route, one path will be preferred. And that's all you're doing. Or you can make one path preferred for one link and one path preferred for the other link, exactly like we did yesterday. And we'll show you how to do that again in about two minutes, how to load your. So let's talk about how we further increase availability. We talked about the AWS virtual router VPN termination device being highly available, which is great. Meaning, if one of their availability zones goes down, your VPN is still going to stay off. But your device is not a highly available, which means if your device goes down, you're down. Which means it doesn't matter that the AWS side is highly available. Your side is not. Your systems will go down. Your systems will fare. So this is no good. So one is none. Two is one. Three is better than two. That means you need a primary path and a backup, which means if you're using a VPN for primary, you're going to need a second internet router for the second VPN if you, want, if you actually want to make it work. Now, I told you before that we can load share across VPNs, just like we can load share across direct connections. But in order to do that, we have to implement a policy. We have to make sure the policy does not give us out-of-order packets. So let's do this. Eric, I am so happy to see you in this group again. Welcome back. So, load sharing across multiple tunnels is, possi is possible. Here's how you do it. So, when you're working with BGP, 
you have to do your routing in two separate connections. So, boy, this is some really pretty pictures that, um, that have a little slight mathematical challenge here. Um, but that's neither here nor there. We'll work with it. <coughs> so, let's look in this environment. What's supposed to let's look at this environment um, from the perspective of the people on the right side. It, the, what we have here is we've got our internet routers, and our internet routers um, uh, are basically going. We've got two links to the cloud. You can see a top link, and you can see on the bottom link. On the top link, what we actually did is. Okay, well, actually, this is a really terrible picture. We don't want to talk about this picture. <gasps> um, but well, what happened in this picture, which was improperly drawn by my graphics team while they were really trying to help me, meaning I probably gave them the wrong IP addresses, what we would be doing is we'd advertise a specific route on the top one and a specific route on the bottom one for a different subnet. So, for example, on the top link, we would advertise 10.1.0.0.16, and on the bottom link, we do 10.1.0.0 slash 16. So we basically have two separate slash 16s as a primary link on the bottom link. And then we would typically have a summary route on the top and the bottom link that would enable for network layer reachability should something happen. So top link, more specific route, bottom link, more specific route. And then we'd send a summary route on both links. The summary route will provide network layer reachability information. Let's get off of this picture. Um, let's just say it's not the best picture to accurately recommend what we're talking about here. These things happen. Apologies. So now let's talk about multi-site VPNs. So where does this stuff get really interesting? The site-to-site -site VPN, we talked about the advantage of it in that it's fast to set up and it's low cost, which is really great. So. Perfect, but what if you have multiple sites? Well, this is where VPNs can really shine should you be able to get away with the performance limitations of a VPN. Why do VPNs shine here? With a VPN, let's say you get a 10 gigabit connection to the internet in one location, and you've got a 10 gigabit, and, and, and you can, from that 10 gigabit Ethernet location, say from your cloud, you could create a VPN to like lots of different places, provided you've got enough bandwidth. Imagine a VPN to New York. A VPN to London, a VPN to San Francisco, all from the same internet connection. So multi-site VPNs get really cool. They are fast to set up, they are easy to set up. And if you don't need guaranteed performance and guaranteed bandwidth and guaranteed latency, multi-site VPNs are awesome. So let's talk about what a multi-site VPN is, multiple connections. Now, realistically speaking, this would be easy and beautiful if it wasn't for the way AWS does the routing. So typically speaking, what you could do is you could create a multi-site VPN where you'd have your, 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 your VPC and you'd create a VPN net connection to Boston, a VPN connection to Washington, and a VPN connection through San Francisco. And what would ultimately happen is this would be, you know, the cloud, the equivalent of your data center, and you'd have this hubless book environment. Now in the real world, Everywhere outside of AWS, what would happen the second you did that, Boston would communicate to Washington through uh, your data center or your cloud. San Francisco could communicate to Boston through your cloud. Everybody would talk to everybody. But not with AWS. Why? AWS does not allow transitive routing. And what is transitive routing? Transitive routing is when you pass routing information from one, one site to another site. So because AWS will not take the routes learned from Boston and share them with Washington and New York, and will not share Washington's routes to Boston and San Francisco, nobody will be able to talk to anybody except your VPC will be able to talk to your remote locations if you just set up VPNs. Now guess what? If your remote sites don't need to talk to each other, this is perfect. It's secure. You've got a lot of extra security, but if your remote sites need to talk to each other, this changes everything. When your remote sites actually need to talk to each other, you need to pass routing information. So how do you pass routing information on the AWS cloud when they don't let you do it? New rule. They created something called Cloud Hub, and Cloud Hub breaks the non-transitive routing rules, just like a BGP route reflector would. And basically what happens is 
When you use Cloud Hub, you connect all your VPNs to VPN Cloud Hub. Now Boston's routing information is passed to Washington and New York, <coughs> and Washington's information is passed to New York and San Francisco, and San Francisco's information is passed to Washington and Boston, and now everybody can talk to everybody in a hub and spoke architecture. So, multi-site VPNs, you could set them up, but not everybody would be able to talk to each other. But if you use Cloud Hub, everybody will be able to talk to everybody, so that's how you're setting up your hub and spoke environments on the cloud. Now, how do you set up a VPN? Well, it's relatively easy. First thing you need, internet access. No internet access, no VPN. Let's assume we're working on the assumption, you've got your internet access, you got your internet access, you can set up your VPN. So, the first thing you need to do after you've got your internet access is determine the AWS VPN gateway you're gonna to connect to. Then, you need to pick a routing method, a static route or a dynamic route. If there's only one connection in, only one way, meaning you don't have any backups, then a static route would be good. If you've got backups, you're better off using dynamic routes. The next thing to do is you set up your tunnel. So AWS will basically give you the default tunnel configuration. And if you don't know what you're doing, and you're not a great networking person, you don't have those CCIE level routing skills, use the default one. No. If you're someone like me and you need to, cons uh, that's been working in tech forever and you've got a 20 plus year old CCIE number, you're probably going to use a custom situation, which is going to give you a lot more flexibility. So if you're a network engineer migrating to cloud computing, you can really tune your VPN tuning here the way you could your router to do, do a custom policy. I think this is something fantastic. So that's another way to do it. Now realize it this way. When you set up these policies and you tell the policy that it wants, it literally configures the VPN gateway for you. And not only that, it, it will, the management console will even get, spit out a cut and paste config that you can put in your router. And this will work with a Juniper router, a Cisco router, a Palo Alto router, and a Fortinet router, which will cover your main your mainstays. So if you're going to use a custom one, you can do it yourself, but if you're going to do the default, it'll take care of it for you. And of course, anytime you're dealing with any tech, you got to monitor and see if it's up and running. So how do you monitor your tech and see if it's up and running? With AWS, you use CloudWatch like you would for everything else. So VPN setup. Set up your internet. Determine who you're going to connect to. Pick your routing method. Configure your tunnels either automatically or via custom policy. And you're good to go. So let's talk about some uh, custom VPNs. If you really need a lot of VPN work, meaning you need something beyond like basic Cloud Hub, meaning you're an enterprise, let's say for example, you've got 100,000 remote employees, you're gonna need something better. Let's say you've got large numbers of remote connections, you're gonna need something better. Let's say you need some more corporate security and lots of VPNs and loads of locations, you're gonna need something better. So. We talked about the basic AWS services, which are going to work for the majority environments from basic customers. But when you've got complex networking requirements, you're going to need something better. So if you need to terminate a large number of VPN connections in your VPC, most people will go to the AWS marketplace. And typically speaking, how would you normally terminate a VPN connection? You would use a VPN concentrator, which is software that people basically create their IPsec tunnels to. It terminates them and puts them behind the firewall. So, if you need to do that in the cloud, you can't walk over to the cloud with your IDS system, IPS system, and your screwdriver, mount it inside of the rack, plug it in. You know, that doesn't happen. But what you can do on the cloud is you can go to the marketplace and you can pick up a virtual appliance that's going to run on an EC2 instance. And this is what you can do. You can get your VPN concentrators from Cisco, Palo Alto. You could even use this common uh, open VPN, um, SSH VPN device. Totally possible. Um, most organizations that need VPN access are going to be using something from Cisco or Palo Alto. But you know, if you're a smaller business or you want to use more of an open uh, standard, more freeware version, you can use Open VPN. It's freeware for a couple of users. It becomes paid for lots of users. But you've got the enterprise functionality like Cisco or Palo Alto, or like the uh, open source option with Open VPN. So either case, you can set up a VPN concentrator in your VPC and get past the basic AWS services, and that's how many of these organizations are going to do it.
So we talked about site-to-site -site VPNs. We talked about multi-site VPNs where you've got one site connected to other people. How about remote access VPNs? Remote access VPNs are basically allowing your remote users. So look at it this way. You know, most people that are home now that are working from home, they're connecting into a VPN. That's a VPN. Well, if you're going to the organization's data center, it's simple. And they go to Cisco, they go to Juniper, Palo Alto, they buy these big giant VPN concentrators. You VPN into them. Perfect. But not in the cloud. In the cloud, you got to go to the marketplace like we talked about. So remote access VPNs in the cloud are basically speaking, you go to the marketplace. Inside of the marketplace, you buy your software on an EC2 instance and you run it. And what does a remote access VPN look like? Um, right over here, this is what a remote access VPN looks like. You can see it basically over here. You've got your users coming in from large numbers of locations to the cloud over the VPNs. So we are now at 1250, which, and we're going to go to direct connections next. But this is the perfect segue for us to go into answering any more questions on VPNs prior to moving on. So as we, I want to make sure we answer any questions. Um, to see if anybody has any questions or answers that, that they need answered on VPNs real quick before we move on to the next topic. Any questions before we move on? And sometimes people ask me why I occasionally look to the left or look to the right on right live streams. Here's the reason. Um, trying to make sure that I can make sure that we're still streaming on one thing screen and see people's questions on another screen. So that's why I might look from screen to screen sometimes if it looks like I'm moving left or right. It's just not obvious. So any more questions before we go into direct connections? Give you guys about one more minute to see if there's another question. And if there's no more questions, what we'll do is we'll just motor through. We'll start working on direct connections. But I don't want anybody to be stuck before we move. Okay, no questions? Sounds great. Let's start moving on towards we're going to go do some direct connections. In the meantime, if you can give us some feedback, if you're enjoying this, if you can leave a like. And okay, there is one question which we'll answer prior to moving on. So leave a like if it's at all possible. And uh, if you're enjoying it and uh, if you're having fun, comment Cloud Architect. So is Transit Gateway better than VPC peering? They're kind of different. So Transit Gateway is going to be like Cloud Hub, and we'll talk about it a little more. Cloud Hub is used when you've got lots of VPCs or remote sites that you want to use over, you want to connect via IPsec. And Transit Gateway is used when you want to connect over direct connections or private lines or VPNs. So Transit Gateway architecturally and Cloud Hub really are using the identical BGP route reflector technology. There's really no difference between them. Now the difference in service is Cloud Hub is for VPNs and Transit Gateway could be VPNs or direct connections or everything, data centers or VPC. So there's more flexibility with Transit Gateway. Going back to VPC pairing versus Transit Gateway versus Cloud Hub, because all three can be done, VPC pairing is used to connect one VPC to another VPC. The reason people are using Cloud Hub or Transit Gateway is AWS does not do transitive routing, which means that because routing information is not exchanged, Let's go back to this diagram with regards to VGP peering, VPC peering. So if we were to pretend this is a VPC, this is a VPC, and this is a VPC, um, realistically speaking, this is VPC peering. But because VPC is peering is not transitive, the Boston information won't be sent to Washington, which won't be sent to San Francisco, which means with traditional VPC peering, Hub spoke, spoke sites won't be able to communicate each other through the hub, which means that if you want that to work, you either have to fully mesh your IBGP peers, which would be perfect. I'm sorry, your BGP peers or your VPC peers, or if, you, if you're not fully meshing them, you're, they won't be able to communicate with each other without something like Cloud Hub or Transit Gateway. So Transit Gateway or Cloud Hub 
are ways to break the AWS non-transitive routing rules to make AWS behave like a network would prior to that. If you want to connect to two different VPCs and two different AWS accounts, create two different VPN connections. Um, and then you'll be good for the person that asked that question. RuPaul. How can we connect to the... Okay, so we answered that question. We answered that question. Room, we're super happy to work with you. Um, fantastic. Let's see if there's any more questions that are actually in here that are related to cloud computing. And for this off topic question from William Wallace, actually this week, I haven't read anything. It's very atypical for me. Um, the reality is, is last weekend, last Friday, I knew we we're going to be doing this thing on Monday. I have about 400 slides here and I went through my slides to try and make sure they were good last weekend. And given that we do free webinars for three hours in the morning and we're doing a three hour session here today, and I still have my students to teach uh, throughout the week. Uh, I have not read any books this week at all and have none on my list until next week. So I have none this week. So never, excuse me, every once in a while, we all need to uh, move some stuff aside and prioritize. But that won't last until next week. Next week there'll be um, a psychology and a sociology book that are there as well as a communications book because I always make sure that I'm always up to date on the latest training and the way people think. Um, the reason think psychology and sociology and economics are so near and dear to everything that I work on every single day of the week is it impacts how we coach our clients to make sure our clients have the best advantages in the world. So typically speaking, there's always something related to psychology or sociology on my weekly reading list. There may also be things related to neuro linguistic programming again to help our clients. There's always something related to tech there's always something to be getting better in some way every form, and I always make a point of doing it every week. Unless I've got a week like this where I know I'll be working at least 100 hours, so then uh, we do what we have to. So let's get into some direct connections. So direct connections are one of my favorite kind of things to do. And Lamet, Cloud Hub and Transit Gateway are effectively the same. The use case is different. AWS will brand the same technology, two things, Cloud Hub VPNs, Transit Gateway, VPNs plus direct connections. And so think of it just more flexibility, but very, very similar in nature. Okay, so you, Wiki, this is an extremely, extremely common issue. So the reason that is typically used is to translate addresses from one to another. So most of the time when we use NAT inside of business in networking, it's often because a company buys one company and buys another company and they need to translate the addresses. Now when you're dealing with AWS, they don't let you do VPC pairing with NAT for the most part it's not supported. So when you're dealing with AWS and one company buys another company, what you're going to use you're going to use the private link service because the private link service automatically does NAT. Then, after the VPCs are paired using the private link, so if they're not using VPC pairing, they're using private link. And then when they're, and that'll take care of that automatically. So basically use the private link, and then when you're doing that, you create secondary addresses on all your systems. And by creating secondary addresses on all your systems, you can then put them on the same subnet, and then you migrate off the old addresses, so the secondary addresses are now unique. And that's how you migrate them. So you use NAT temporarily through private link, and then you change the IP addresses. Then they're not overlapping, and you've got good routing. That's the way you do it. You wiki. We've been doing it for 30 years. Uh, I've been doing it for 25 plus years, but people have been using that same methodology on and off the cloud. Ian Corner, if you want to do a VPN service, all you need is to set up a is a public IP address and then just set up a VPN service to the cloud. You can do it in anywhere you want. It doesn't matter which uh, geography you go to as long as you've got IP reachability to it. 
but you will need a public IP address on the far end. Any more questions? Otherwise, we go to uh, direct connections. There's a bit of a lag, so if it ever looks like I'm waiting for questions to be asked, that is the reason why. So, let's go do some fun with direct connections. So first, let's talk about what a direct connection is. A direct connection is the equivalent of a wire that you're buying between one location and another. It's not exactly a wire, but it's the equivalent of a wire. For those of you that have a network background, we're talking about a private line. <coughs> we're talking about a pseudo wire. That's a direct connection. <coughs> and a direct connection gives you the ability to get a private line. So why would you use a direct connection? Why not just use a VPN? Well, we talked about the internet having a lot of problems. The, there's no bandwidth guarantees. There's no latency guarantees. So the internet is deemed unreliable. It may work great, it may not, but it's considered to be best effort non-reliable transport. So if you need reliable transport, you must use a direct connection. If you need guaranteed bandwidth, you need a direct connection. If you need to know that your 10 gigs is really 10 gigs, you need a direct connection. Because the internet, your 10 gigs could be 10 gigs, or it could be zero, you don't know. If you need consistent latency, meaning you need to know the time it takes to get across the link is three milliseconds and it never changes, you need a direct connection because the internet could be one millisecond, a hundred milliseconds, one millisecond lost data. So if you need guaranteed latency, again, you're there. If you need the highest reliability, you're there. See, the bandwidth doesn't change. If you've got a wire, it's all the same bandwidth. It, latency or the time it takes for the speed of light or the electron to cross a wire or a photon to cross a wire doesn't change. So that's why these direct connections offer consistent guaranteed bandwidth and performance. Now let's talk about you know, these groups. Now when you're dealing with a direct connection, you can get them in one gig, 10 gig, or 100 gig <coughs> links. And that's great. It gives you an opportunity for bandwidth. Now AWS also supports something called a link aggregation group. And what is a link aggregation group? A link aggregation group as is follows. Let's say I've got one link, two links, three links, four links. If I have four separate links, to the, I've got to do some really tricky work with routing. Yesterday I showed you how we leak more specific routes or prepend AS pass. But what if I could take these four links separate and bundle them together to look like one big link like my arm? So instead of having four little skinny links, I've got one big link like my arm. That's what a link aggregation groups and enables you to bundle up to four links together to get speed and performance. What else is cool about link aggregation? Let's say I've got four, four cables in the, in the group. What happens if one of the cables goes down? I still have three that are up. So a link aggregation group can give you performance as well as high availability, and that's what a link aggregation group is. So direct connection, pseudo wire, link aggregation for people from the networking world, it's like ether channel or port aggregation protocol, but here it's link aggregation groups. That's the same concept. So what makes the direct connection work? Well, for the most part, once you get above 100 meters, you're dealing with fiber optic connections because that's kind of the limitation of, ether, of, of, of you know cable, copper ethernet. So you're going to be using a fiber optic connection. Now that means your router, your device that's going to connect to the cloud, must have a fiber optic port and it also has to have the optic. So if you're not used to these things when you see a switch, the switch itself is going to have a hole where the fiber optic port is and you stick a, an optic in there that's got some lasers and you plug your cables into there. So that's the way it's going to look. So you're going to be using a fiber optic port. Now, there's basically single mode fiber and, and multi mode fiber. Long distance, and this is always going to be long distance, always uses single mode fiber. So if you see a test question, what type of fiber, it's going to be single mode fiber because it's long distance. And the two types of single mode fiber that are, that are supported are SMF 1000 base LX and 10 base and 10 G base LR for the one gig and the 100 gig. They've recently supported 100 gig links as well, um, but the one gig link or SMF 1000 base dash LX and the 10 gig is 10 G base dash LR that you're using with. They're your standard um, um, one gig and 10 gig links that you'd be using a fiber optic single mode fiber connection for. 
No. And Faisal, no, only four links. They don't let you do more than four links <coughs> with AWS. Now, if you've ever worked with and an, an, an Rizwan Faisal, they must be the same speed. So one gig links can be bundled with one gig and 10 gig links can be bundled with 10 gig. And if you're like me and you've worked with fiber optic connections, you realize that there's two wires. There's a send link and a receive link. Now, because you've got a send link and a receive link when you're working with fiber optics, some ugly stuff can happen. If the send link is up and the receive link is down, you're not communicating, but it might still look up to the routers and switches, which means if you've got multiple links, a primary and a backup, and one of the links doesn't get marked inactive because it's really down, you've got a problem. So because we've been having this kind of problem for a long time with fiber optics, we'd have your fiber optic cable and one link would go down and the other would stay up. That obviously caused problems. We came up with the concept of bi-directional forwarding detection, which is basically a protocol that's used with uh, lasers, which means fiber optic connections, to basically determine if a connection is fully up. So, kind of like a health check, bilateral forwarding detection will determine if it makes sense to take down, for example, your fiber optic connection because it's only working in one direction, meaning send or receive, but not bilaterally. So, AWS does support that. So. Now, when you're sending your information to AWS, you're going to be sending to them in a layer two environment. And what that means is when you get your connection to them, you're going to be in a VLAN and you're going to have to send your v you're going to have to send them your, your information on a dot one Q with a dot one Q tag. And here's the issue AWS, what will happen. And I'm going to show you architecturally what it's going to look like is going to take your information and they're going to trunk it back via backhaul back to their, their environment. So we'll, we'll show you exactly what that's going to look like and all the direct connection architecture things and public and private interfaces and things uh, momentarily. But I at least wanted to at least go over the concepts. So architecturally, this is what a direct connection is going to look like. It's just going to look like you have a wire. But that's not exactly what's going on, but that's what it's going to look like. We'll, in a minute, basically show you all the things that work internally. So a direct connection, I want you to visualize it as a wire between your organization and the cloud. Now, this, you're not going to have reality this single mode fiber strand that's going to go between you and the far end. There are several stops along the way. And we're going to talk now about those several stops. And, and we'll, we'll answer your question, the last question in a minute. So what exactly you're doing? When you're purchasing this direct connection, you're not exactly purchasing it between your location and the end destination. See, here's what's really happening. You're gonna buy a direct connection and basically you're buying a direct connection to the direct connection location. And when you're in the direct connection location, you're basically buying your first connection to your router, which is sitting in the direct connection location. So from you to the direct connection location. Now that only connects you to the point of presence, the direct connection location, but that does not connect you to AWS, not even a little bit. It just connects you to that building. See, so you connect to you where it says customer in this direct connection location. Now in the same location where you are, AWS has their direct connection location switch routers as well. So they've got a connection from their routers and they've got this link where it says AWS backbone where it backhauls the information to AWS. So if you just connect to the direct connect location and AWS is connecting the location back to AWS, you're still not actually going to be communicating with them because right now they have two separate networks. They have a separate network for the AWS side where it says AWS hardware highlighted in red and the pink thing going back. And you have your information is highlighted by your blue WAN and your routers. So it has to happen when you want a direct connection, here's what you need to do. Oops. You're actually purchasing a direct connection for here. 
you have to go to AWS and you have to get what's called a letter of authorization. And we'll basically tell you, the letter of authorization will give your service provider the ability to plug in a cable or a fiber optic connection between your router and between their router. So you're going to buy a connection to the direct connection location. You're going to apply for what's called a letter of authorization. The letter of authorization will provide a cross connect, meaning they'll allow the service provider to provide a cable from your device to their device. And then it's effectively like you've got a wire all the way back to your own AWS account. That's the way these direct connection locations work. Um, Mr. Rajan, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your feedback. Um, Mr. Mohammed, um, uh, I'm going to get ask you in the next break exactly what you mean by that so we can try and accommodate you because I want to make sure we do everything we can to help all of you as much as we can. But I just need more clarification for what you're looking for. So now let's talk more about that letter of authorization. What is this letter of authorization? The letter of authorization basically is permission for your service provider to do that cross connect between your device and their device. But you have to apply for this letter of authorization because that's your permission to connect to the AWS network. Otherwise, you'd just be hacking into it. <clears throat> so here's how you get it. You go to the management console, the, AL, the API or the CLI, however you're going to access it, and you fill out an application. As soon as your application is complete, what's going to happen is AWS will provision the switch part at the direct connection location for your cross connect. And then what's going to happen is you're going to download the letter of authorization, give it to your service provider, and they're going to just run that cable from your switch to their switch. And we're Naveed, what's going on is Chris is actually writing down your questions and we'll actually, as well as Unas's, and we're going to answer them on the next break, which will occur in 10 minutes. So normally speaking, you just get a direct connection through the process that we just described. Now, what if you didn't need a full gig or you didn't need a full 10 gig or you didn't need a full 100 gig? You have the opportunity to go to what's called the direct connection partner and they're a service provider. And basically what will happen is instead of going directly to AWS, you would go to a Direct Connect partner and they would sell you the link to them. So basically they would sell you the link and what they would do is they would implement what's called a rate limiting policy on their link. They would limit your speed to whatever speed they sold you. So you're still going to buy a 1 gig or a 10 gig link, but they would add like a committed access rate, rate limiting policy on your port. So that if, you, you know, if, you, if, they, if you're only paying for 50 megs or 100 megs or 3 gigs or whatever based upon your link speed, you're going to do that from the Direct Connect partner. And it's a way for you to buy less than you're needing. Now, when you're dealing with a partner, what's going to happen is they're going to give you lower costs. It's going to be a higher course per bandwidth, but it might be cheaper than the thing. Because if you only need a, half a, a 500 megabyte of your gigabit link, you can buy that, which is half the, half the speed. So it'll be cheaper overall but you're going to pay more per gigabyte than you actually would as if you dealt with them directly and whenever you're dealing with these direct connect partners or aws you have to use an 802.1q trunk which means you effectively are trunking to them now if aws did all layer 3 routing you wouldn't be using an 802.1q tag you'd be using ip routing and they would do it that way but they're using an, a layer 2 backhaul and that's why you have to use a trunk port and give them on a vlan with an 802.1q tag. So now let's talk about public and private interfaces of these uh, types of gateways, of your, of your direct connection gateways. You got the opportunity to connect publicly and privately. So a public interface is this. When you set up your direct connection, your public interface is going to give you access to public services. So what would these public services be? Things like DynamoDB, SQS, and public endpoints. So these are the things that you would use the public virtual interface for of your direct connection. So public interface. Now, that's why you would use these things. So when you're dealing with AWS and you're dealing with routes and BGP, you have to understand that AWS does not pass your routing information to anyone else. 
So it's almost as if you were using the BG community, community no export. AWS will not take in your routes and share them to someone else. They do not want you to become a transit internet service provider for the entire world. Realize with AWS, you are dealing with an extremely, extremely, extremely limited BGP implementation. The number of routes is extremely small. 100 in some places and 1,000 in other places. So super small. So when you're dealing with limited routes, what do you have to do? Route summarization. Route aggregation, all the cool fun stuff. Summarize your routes, and when you summarize your routes, um, you'll be able to do these kinds of things. So at least understand that. So that's what the public interface for is to connect the public AWS service. Public endpoints, S3, DynamoDB, SQS. Now private endpoints. Private endpoints and private virtual interfaces connect to your stuff, your VPC. And since it's private, you can use your private IP addresses on both sides of your BGP pairing connection. And again, really, really, really limited number of routes you can advertise via BGP. A hundred. A hundred routes of BGP, excuse me, is nothing. When you connect to an internet service provider, you're taking in over 300, 300, three quarters of a million routes. With AWS, it's only a hundred. How do you deal with a hundred? You summarize, route summarize, and route summarize some more. So your IP addressing scheme is really, really critical. So the next thing we'll, actually, you know what? Now we're getting into some pretty complicated concepts of direct connect gateways, redundant connections, and so some other things. So it looked like there were a fair number of questions that actually came in in the last few minutes. So let me take a quick break, answer these questions, and then we're gonna get back to having the fun talking about direct connections. How's that sound to everybody? Derek, uh, first question, great question. When you connect to the actual AWS data center, these are real switches. So when you plug in a direct connection, you need a real, real, real switch to terminate your actual, uh, to terminate your connection, to terminate the wire. So it's gonna be a wire for which the connection is gonna be going across. Because it's a wire, you're gonna be dealing with a, your own router switch and their own router switch, and they're gonna be physical devices in the point of presence kind of stuff that we network engineers have been working on for decades. So, Guy Wittenhouse, um, you're generally sending them one VLAN, um, but yes, you could potentially send them multiple VLANs over your direct connection. If you were gonna be connecting to different public and private interfaces, you could do different things. Does a separate direct connection region require a direct connect or could you use a direct connect gateway? Well, Lamat Sharma, I want you to really think about that from a logical perspective. If you have a direct connection that's using a direct connect gateway and it's a true disaster recovery environment and the connection that you have is coming just from your data center and that were to go down, your direct, you would have no connectivity whatsoever to all your disaster recovery sites, despite it actually being a logical direct connect gateway. So if you're doing any kind of serious direct connect and you're doing any kind of serious high availability and disaster recovery, just because AWS says, look, it's logical and it goes to lots of different places. Well, on the surface, that is an absolutely wonderful thing. And we love that. It's great. But more pragmatically, the problem associated with that is just because that's actually working doesn't mean your device is highly available. So depending upon the architectural needs that you have, don't just assume that just because their device is redundant that your device is, you might need more than one and you might want more than one connection. So it's really based upon the kind of connectivity and requirements you have. Well, Lama Sharma, one thing that I will tell you is if you've got a 10 gig link, you're never going to be able to go more than 10 gigs. So you'll be able to go up to the speed, and yes, it would split it amongst both of them. Let me see if Chris was able to aggregate any other questions. 
Okay, Yunus Muhammad, are you still there? You said, please do more videos on different configuration of AWS cloud service. I don't know what you mean by that. Are you referring to architecture? Or are you referring to engineering hands-on configuration? Could you let me know what you mean by that? So I'm not really sure what your, uh, your, your question is, Unos. If you're looking for architecture work, we are happy to do a tremendous, tremendous amount of architecture training to the community. The reason we typically don't focus on how to configure a command line or how to configure the management console is as follows. That is an available on every possible $10 Udemy course which teaches you the name of the service and how to configure it, but not actually how to do the job and be hireable. So the architect's job, and we predominantly work with architects, is the system designer, not system configuring. We all need to know how to configure the systems, but any book can teach somebody how to design the system, how to basically configure the systems. I use an eight-year-old little girl to do it, and she is cute when she does it, and I love working with this. So. We teach people much more how to do the job. The job of the cloud architect, the solutions architect, the enterprise architect is the designer, not the configurer. So we keep our training hyper-focused on everything that's necessary to get hired. So because we keep our training on what's necessary to get hired, we remove all the stuff that's not going to help people with their job in favor. We swap it out with the things that are going to give them the skills. There are hundreds of thousands of available cloud architect jobs that are open. And the last thousand people I interviewed, not a single person was even able to do the job, but they all knew how to set up an EC2 instance or an S3 bucket, but none could work as an architect. So in our training, we focus exclusively on the skills needed to do the job. That's why we focus so heavily on networking, so heavily on security, so heavily on design, so heavily on how to design things, so heavily involved in asking the right questions to the people at the customer side presenting them. We want you hired. We want you paid more, so we're trying to train you for that. So that's why we do these types of training the way we do it. We've been architects. I've been an architect for the last 25 years. Let me tell you, as an architect, no coding, no configuring, all design. So we're training architects. We're training design. Is it important to know how to build these things? Sure. I recommend you absolutely do learn how to practice, how to do every one of them, just so you know, so you know all the idiosyncrasies of the solutions, but as an architect, you're going to be designer. Smart guy, do I do courses like this for AWS certs? Well, given that we're doing an AWS advanced networking course right now, um, we're definitely doing something like this for AWS certs. Um, we also did a free AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional course on our, on our website, and you can view that here, as well as an AWS uh, Certified Solution Architect Associate course. We definitely have that here. Again, they're all completely free. We make our certification training completely free. We do it on the internet for this reason. Certification training is a part of getting the job. It's about 10%. We give that 10% away for free. As an organization, we teach the other 90% what it takes from going from being cloud certified to cloud hired. Huge difference, the other 90%, soft skills, emotional intelligence, presentation skills, architecture skills, knowledge of the network and the data center, the design part. That's where we focus as an organization. We focus on getting people hired, teaching them how to earn more and negotiate a higher salary, how to interview. That's our focus with our training programs, and yes, we provide training courses for AWS certs. This is one of them for the advanced networking, free one for the certified secure, certified for the certified solution architect, associate, and professional, all on our YouTube channel. So I hope I answered your questions there, smart guy. Any other questions prior to going back into direct connections? Okay, well, we're going to head in Direct Connect Gateway. So the Direct Connect Gateway lets you combine, when you do your direct connections, connecting to both the public and the private side or multiple virtual direct connect ways. So in other words, you can use your direct connection to connect here. Let's say I want to use a direct connection to connect to US East but I also want to connect to US West, I can do that with the uh, basically Direct Connect Gateway. It's going to take my direct connection and then split it out. Now granted, I think the question was, if I've got a 10 gig link, I'm never going to get above 10 links. It's going to be shared bandwidth at that point. But the Direct Connect Gateway lets you share that link across it. And it's much like 
a point to multi point um, connection that we used to deal with in frame relay or ATM where you could basically create a point to multi point link. It's pretty much the same thing. It uses the same underlying virtual tenant kind of technology. Well, not ATM, but it uses the same way that we created all these environments forever. So basically the way this is going to work, you'd set up your direct connect gateway and it's going to create these logical private connections for you. And then when you're dealing with logical connections, you still need to basically have your routing. So that's where you're going to do your uh, VPC pairing for your routing. So I'm sorry, your BGP pairing. So that's how your routing's going to be. So you're going to create your direct connect location, your direct connect gateway, and you'll you'll set up your BGP pairing sessions, and that's how your routing information will be shared. Now, when you hear people like me talk about VPC pairing, BGP pairing, it's all coming from the same things. It all has the same tenants. So we network people all, all automatically start looking at things from the network perspective, just because that's you know who we are. So logically, let's look at this direct connect gateway. What is this direct connect gateway doing? What's going on here? So let's look at our environment. Let's say we've got three VPCs. We've connected them to our direct connect gateway. And you can see our corporation has connected to the direct connect location. Inside of the direct location, that connection, we've got a cross connect from our router to AWS. Then we hit the direct connect gateway and we're hitting multiple regions. So that's the way these direct connect gateways work for high availability connections through the cloud. Now let's talk about designing high availability systems. Many customers, meaning average customers, are going to probably be best with a direct connection as their primary link and a VPN backup. This is going to be cost effective. Now, the good and the bad. The good with this environment, you get good high performance, um, guaranteed performance primary link. Your backup link, well, there's no guarantees, but it's cost effective. So highly effective primary link. If your primary link fails, you fail over to your VPN. VPN's cheap, it's available, it can work good. But if your network performance can't, if you need guaranteed network performance, even on failover, then VPN is a backup, it's not a good environment. What does this look like using a VPN backup? Again, average customer, Perfect, perfect, perfect solution is as follows. It's just doing this. You connect your organization to the direct connection to your environment. You connect to the internet, create a VPN. Primary works, VPN is basically standby. Highly useful, highly capable, highly, highly functional for the average organization. But what if you're not an average organization? What if you're a bank? What if you're a hospital? What if you're an organization that's dependent upon your technology? What happens if you were running a hospital and your systems were hosted in the cloud and your network went down and you couldn't figure out what was going on with your patients, what medications were administered? People could die. This is a bad situation. So you're not having a primary link and a backup internet link for this environment. What if you're a bank? What if you're running an algorithmic training application where one minute of downtime costs $5 million? and you need guaranteed latency. Well, guess what? The cost of that backup direct connection is cheap compared to the cost of downtime. You're not getting away with a direct connection and a backup VPN. So you've got to, as the architect, everything that you're actually doing is you're really, really, really looking for all of the necessary things that you need to do, and then you're going to design them. So what does the environment tell you? If you need high performance direct connection, you might need a direct connection backup. And you might even need a VPN to back up your second direct connection. You might need three direct connection backup. That's all going to be based upon the reliability needs of the organization. <coughs> it matters. What the organization needs is how you design it based upon their needs. So when you do backup direct connections, I'm going to give you some advice. If you've got a primary connection through Verizon and you have a backup connection through Verizon, and there's a problem with the Verizon network. Anybody see any problems here? Your primary and direct connection, both your direct connection and your backup direct connection could go down. So primary direct connection with Verizon, backup connection with AT&T, now you're in a much better situation. So you need to be across different service providers for your primary and your backup connections. But you not only need to be across service providers, you need to make sure your service providers are not sharing connectivity. So the way these WAN links typically work is 
you've got a carrier that gets you to the that gets you um, to your carrier and then there's your carrier so it's quite possible that you could have Verizon for your primary link all the way across and Verizon as your primary link to get to AT&T obviously you can't do that in high availability so what we're really trying to talk about what we mean by this is you've got a primary link on one provider and your backup links need to be on a completely discrete secondary provider so when you're making these connections you need to make sure that there's no sharing among services because if you've got Verizon Verizon in any way shape and form or AT&T AT&T and there's a problem with the AT&T network you are completely done so make sure a primary and a backup paths are completely set so that's part of your direct connections and the way you're going to architect so in a high availability environment it's going to look mostly like this what you're going to have is you're going to have your device going through a direct connect location to a router and then honestly you should be using a different direct connect location across a different service provider back to the aws backbone this is a high availability high performance redundant direct connection environment this is the kind of environment i would design for a bank or a healthcare organization and these systems work fantastic fantastic now let's look at the alternative architecture let's say you've got a direct connection and a vpn backup of course in this vm vpn backup um, we're not going to be necessarily using this direct connection location I don't really draw my own graphics. Uh, I have other people uh, draw my graphics for me and I give them samples. So your direct connection would be uh, what you'd see over here and your VPN connection would be using the internet. So just replace this direct connection location with uh, the internet and everything would work perfectly. So in this particular environment, yes, you can load share across direct connections. Yesterday morning in the VGBGP section, we showed you what to do. We showed you one way that you could actually load share across a direct connection would be to do the following, leak a more specific route. We also showed you some other ways that we could do some direct connection things. Um, for example, as with route summarization and the such. So typically speaking, you can load share across redundant direct connections without getting out of order packets but you need to know what you're doing if you don't know what you're doing and you've got a primary and a backup direct connection make the primary used make the backup backup so only only if you understand this at a ccie level how to basically prioritize traffic then you should use a primary and then you should load share across them if you don't um realistically speaking then you're not going to be in a good situation to do these kinds of things so in order to load share, make certain, make certain, make certain that you know what you're doing. Now, we'll, we talked a little bit about link aggregation groups. So we're going to talk a little bit more here. A link aggregation group is just a way that you can actually bundle um, ports to create a higher speed connection to the cloud. So by doing this, if you've got four 1 gig links, you can create a 4 gig link. If you've got four 10 gig links, you can create a four 40 gig link. So just know that all links need to be the same speed, type, and latency. So we got four links in, our Verizon, in a group. If they're coming from Verizon, they should probably all be from Verizon. You want a backup link aggregation group? Make them all from the AT&T. Make your link aggregation group same speed, same type, same latency. That generally means same service provider. So just understand this with regards to these. Now, when you're doing your link aggregation groups, should you need to tune them, you have another option. The second option you actually have in your link aggregation groups is the performance of them. Let's say, normally speaking, if you've got four 10 gig links in a link aggregation group, you've got 40 gigs. And if one of the 10 gig link fails, guess what? You still have 30 and the link aggregation group stays up. But what if you have a primary and a backup link aggregation group and you want to use the highest performance one? You can literally set a policy that says, if a certain number of links fail in a link aggregation group, remove it from the rotation so you switch over to the other link aggregation group so you've got some tuning here what do these link aggregation groups actually look like in practicality here is your high availability environment with link aggregation groups so let's look at it here for a second let's work on the assumption that you're going to connect your data center to the cloud across redundant routers across two different redundant direct connect locations if you've got four 10 gig links in your primary direct location, now let's talk about failover redundancy. If we're dealing with 40 gigs primary bandwidth when things are good, do we really think we can get away with a one gigabit Ethernet VPN backup? Of course not. You can't go from 40 gigs to one. 
So if you're in such a situation where your bandwidth requires you to bundle four 10 gig links in order to get enough bandwidth, your backup link aggregation group probably needs four 10 gig links. So the reason so much of the architect's job is actually evaluating the performance needs, the current systems, is in order to move them from the data center to the cloud, you need to know exactly what they are. If you don't know exactly what they are, you're never going to be in a position to be able to migrate them because you need to know exactly what they are. So those are the kind of things that really matter. That's why we're talking about them. So architecturally speaking, I want you to think about them. We are getting ready to enter this uh, DNS environment. And DNS is not an exciting, fun topic. I wish it was. DNS is a highly useful topic. So before we get to DNS, let us know if you're having fun. If you're having fun, leave a like or type the word Cloud Architect or ideally do both for us. If you're having any questions, ask the questions right now so we can answer them. We love answering questions around here. We want to help you in your cloud computing career. So help us help you. Any questions? Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Delroy. We're still here, Sharma, but thank you so much. Um, we really want to build that kind of cloud architect knowledge that everybody has. So thank you. We really need feedback so we know, you know, because I can get a little techie in the weeds when we're starting to talk about networking stuff. Normally I focus on leadership and serious things like interview tactics and building your career. But when it comes to networking things, I've been involved in networking for so long, it's an extremely fun time. Any more questions before we go to the next topic? Yeah, they are used as a in the debate, but the reality is, is you can only use one link to one place. So all these logical connections, they have their weaknesses. So they have their strengths and weaknesses, but if you need real work, you need two links, you need two routers on your end. Okay, so now, since I didn't see any additional questions, oh, I see one, okay, hold on. So Derek, it's a good question. So by default, if you have a link aggregation group with multiple links in the direct connection bundle, if a link goes down and you've got others there, it will stay up. It is only if you create a special policy that's based upon bandwidth will it go down to remove it from the bundle. Oh, um, for Sharma, for people that have less than 15 kilobytes of, of data that they're sending, probably don't need a direct connection in the first place, and they probably could be using uh, a VPN. When we're talking about direct connection architectures, we're talking about organizations that have real network performance, real compute system performance. Um, so, uh, real stuff is going on. And yes, Derek, when you've got a link aggregation group that's got four of them, if one of the links, for example, goes down in the bundle, the under three stay up. So not only do link aggregation groups improve performance, they improve availability. So they are a really, really great way to do things. And because when you take these four links and you bundle them together in a link aggregation group and they look like one, 
there's no complicated routing to worry about all because it just looks like a single link. So link aggregation groups are really, really great. So let's talk about DNS. So when we're discussing DNS and we're discussing DNS, DNS or the domain name system is really a system that's been designed to help make life easier for humans like us. See, it's pretty easy to remember the name Cisco.com or Amazon.com or GoCloudArchitects.com or GoCloudCareers, which is our, really our name, .com. And when you want to go find go, GoCloudCareers.com, it's pretty easy. You can remember it. But it'd be pretty darn hard to actually figure out the actual IP address, for, remember the IP address for GoCloudCareers or GoCloudArchitects, whichever term you want to use. So that's where DNS comes from. DNS, or the domain name system, makes life really easy by mapping a name to an IP address. That's exactly what a D, the domain name system does. So, DNS does a lot more than that, but it's simple. Arun, it looks like you've got some questions. Chris, if you can take down these questions, we'll get them at the next break. So let's look architecturally, you know, what DNS is like to simplify it. Let's say I'm here in my home, I'm the user, and I want to go to Amazon. Now, if I knew the IP address, the exact IP address name for Amazon, I could just enter it in my browser. But I don't. And their website isn't going to be changing IP. Well, their CloudFront location won't be changing, but I could be hitting 15 different servers or hundreds or thousands of different servers, all of which have different IP addresses behind the load balancer. So I'm going to go to www.amazon.com on my browser, my computer does not know the IP address because it's not stored in its cache. I'm going to reach out to the DNS server and I'm going to be looking for who has the IP address to our organization. The DNS server, I mean to Amazon, the DNS server is going to say, here's the IP address. And then my computer is going to use the IP address to connect to Amazon. That's the basis of DNS. It just mapped a, a, a name. And if you're curious and you want to see these things, just go to your computer, um, do an NS lookup, enter the fully qualified domain name that you want, and you're going to get a lot of things. You're going to find your DNS server addresses, which mine are 8.8.8, .8 .8, which coincidentally are Google's. And then you're going to see, you know, all about this. You're going to look at the name Amazon.com, and then you're actually going to find the exact name of the CloudFront location and the IP address. That's it. That's how you can figure out. That's what your computer connects to. Now you know. So what goes into these names? User-friendly names sound great, right? Well, the domain main name is really broken down into three separate sections. So your host name is basically the name of the endpoint. That's the name of your computer. Or it could be www as well. And there's the domain name, which is basically the name of the site you're going to. And then there's the top level domain. And we'll work through all of this as part of the fully qualified domain names. Host name could be www. Domain name could be gocloudcareers.com. Top level domain, I'm sorry, would be gocloudcareers. Top level main would be .com. So that's the basis of a domain name. So what goes into this name, this fully qualified domain name? It, again, it's the host name, the domain name, and the name. But it could also be, a, you could also create something called a subdomain. So when people go to my website for training, you know, my main website is www.gocloudcareers.com. Or I also have a www.gocloudarchitects.com. But I have a training page called training.gocloudarchitects.com. That training is a subdomain. And when you create a subdomain or organizations create a subdomain, it's immediately going to be to the left of the domain. And examples like that, for example, are, for example, like mail.google.com. That's an example of a subdomain. So let's talk about you know, this, the elements of the domain. Let's begin with the top level domain or the .com, the .net, the .edu. So the top level domains are going to be controlled by an organization called the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And these are going to be parties that are going to distribute the top level domains. The top level domains are going to be the second highest level of the DNS system because it's hierarchical in nature. And the root domain is going to be the overarching structure that everything becomes part of it.
Now, when you're dealing with the top level domains, it used to be .com, .net, .edu, .uk. But now there's a lot more of them, and they're consistently getting more like .co. So realize there's a lot, or .aws. They're coming up with a lot more top level domains because we're running out of creative names that we could possibly use. And when it comes to the top level domain servers, realistically speaking, what's going on is there servers that are basically going to facilitate the generation of IP addresses, meaning if there's none of these servers, basically um, DNS wouldn't work if you didn't have your top level domain servers. So when you're dealing with DNS, it's really being broken down into multiple zones. And what's going to happen is each of these zones is going to be managed by a different uh, component of the DNS namespace and managed by different entities. So what's going on is you've got a, it, this is designed to basically sim simply allow more authoritative finer grade control of the components of the DNS system. However, this doesn't mean that zones are necessarily geographically isolated, just that they're logically separated by who controls them. That's really all that's going on. Remember, the DNS system is a hierarchical system with the root domain at the top. So what does it look like? DNS looks like this. You've got your root domain at the top. Then you've got your top-level domain, like your .com, .net, .edu. Then you've got your domain that you purchase, and then you've got your subdomain. So that's really the way this sort of works. So while we're talking about DNS, which is not my favorite topic because I'm a routing and switching guy versus a DNS guy, we still have to talk about DNS. It's pretty important. Basically, what's going on is there's a registry. And this registry is really a database that contains all the domain names and all of the associated top-level domains. It's a registry. It's a database. And what happens is there's these organizations that manage the top-level domains page. For example, VeriSign manages a lot of the .com domains. I think all of them, actually. And what happens is there's this umbrella. We talked about ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which is this big global, you know, nonprofit managed the technical operations, and they define a policy of how the names and numbers are going to be used. And to some degree, it's got a centralized control of the DNS system. So they're kind of the, the leaders of the way this works. But So they're the registry. Now then there's the registrar. So at the leader, you've got ICANN that's the registry, but then you've got other people that do the registrations for you. So a registrar are the people that you go to to register a name. A DNS name, say a company like GoDaddy or Amazon Route 53, that's a registrar. When you want a domain, you go there to purchase one. Now, these organizations are going to sell domain names, basically. So the registrars will handle the reservation of domain names to IP addresses. And as we talked about earlier, the registrars don't exactly manage the domain, manage or maintain the domain. They just sell them to you. So the registry is at the top. And, and think of that as ICANN. Um, but think of the registrars as people like GoDaddy or AWS Route 53 that sell you the domain. That's the registrar. Now let's talk about the registrant. The registrant is the user that registers something. So when I registered GoCloud Architects and GoCloud Careers, I am the DNS registrant. So the registry is ICANN who maintains it. I went to GoDaddy and bought it. They are the registrars, and I'm the registrant because I register it. So I'm the corporation. Well, I have a corporation. It was the people that purchased this. So now let's look at it. What does this hierarchy actually look like when we put it all into action? It looks like this. It looks like at the top of the environment, you've got the registry. Then you've got the registrar, which are the people that sell it to you, and you are the registrant as the purchaser. This is kind of the way this kind of DNS kind of thing works. So I'm going to keep going for a few more minutes. Now we're going to talk about DNS record types. Now when you're dealing with DNS and you're dealing with this database of record types and users, we're kind of in this environment where we need to know certain records. So the record types are basically going to give you information about certain things. And record types are off, or DNS records are going to be known as zone files. And really what's going on is there are a particular set of constructions for the DNS servers. And these record types are going to be in a particular format, which is going to follow the standard DNS syntax, which is going to be basically a text file. And in there, there's going to be some things that are specified. There's going to be like a time to live, which is basically how long the server will keep the records before it's refreshed. And it's typically measured in seconds unless confirmed otherwise. 
there is a massive list of DNS records. And uh, in order to do that, we, you, you need to know some of them, but not all of them. We'll teach you the types that you do. So when we talk about DNS records, we're really talking about a few of them. And these are the ones that I think you need to know. But actually, we'll give you a list of the main ones, and I'll give you the list that you need to know. So the A record, definitely need to know. The quad A record or the AAA record, we'll talk about that in a minute. You need to know that, realistically speaking, you're going to need, need to know the MX record, which is necessary if you want to send or receive email. You'll need to know the start of authority or name server record, and typically seeking the sender policy framework or record types that you need to know. So let's talk about some of these records and what they actually mean. The DNS A record, pretty important for you to know. Fundamental, most common DNS record maps a name to an IP address. Go Cloud Careers to an IP address. Basic, basic, basic DNS record. Use it everywhere. So, so happy to hear you're having fun there, Alonzo. Um, if we missed a few items, we'll go back and answer the questions. A DNS record, most fundamental, maps a name to an IP address. Simple, simple, simple. Now with IPv6, they've got an AAA record. AAA -A -A record. It's just a DNS A record, but for IPv6. No big deal, easy to remember, lots of fun. Now, that's an A record. What about a C name record? This is a very common one you need to know. A C name record is really a record that maps one domain to another domain. What's this look like? So, if I want to map www.a.com to www.b.com, it's a C name record. So, there, it's similar to an alias record, but a scene mem record is really where you're mapping one domain to another domain. Now let's talk about an NS record. You need to know this one as well. An NS record identifies the DNS servers that are we going to be responsible for your DNS zone. Who are the authoritative servers? That's your DNS NS record. Now the next record is called an MX record. And if you want to again be able to send and receive email, you need to have this nook record and you need to understand this. An MX record specifies which mail servers can accept mail for your domain. So must be there if you want to be able to send and receive email. The last record that we're going to talk about is the start of authority record. And the start of authority record is the primary name server available for your region. And it will also list the primary party responsible for your region. So that's where we're talking about the DNS records. So, more cop topics we're going to talk about in DNS, and we're going to go into the AWS Route 53 implementation in a second. But we did a bit of a high-level overview of DNS. As you know, I always want my students to know the technology long before we talk about the way we're actually going to implement it with, or use it in AWS. Because as an architect, you need to be able to understand all of the systems, how they work, and why they use them long before you pick the name of the service. So, let's go back and see if we've got some questions to ask. Answer. So Arun, first question I see. A direct connect is needed when you need to guarantee performance over a connection. So if you've got the need for guaranteed performance, use a direct connection. If you don't have a need for guaranteed performance, don't use a direct, you, you don't need to use a direct connection, you can use a VPN. <coughs> Any more questions going on right now? I'm sure there's some more questions as well. So please feel free to ask any questions you may have. Any more questions coming? Any more questions? I mean, I can go back to DNS. I just want to make sure nobody's lost. I don't just want to be pushing content, 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 content without anybody knowing that you're making sure you're understanding. We want to make sure you're understanding it. If you're here, let us know by typing Cloud Architect. I see 64 viewers are supposed to be here. Everybody's quiet, which either means I'm doing a really, really, really good job explaining this, or people are saying DNS is no fun and Mike's putting me to sleep, in which case that would upset me. So if you're alive, awake, alert, and oriented and having fun, let me know what the words Cloud Architect. If you want me to speed up the DNS sections, you know, say speed up DNS, Mike, and I'm happy to do that too. I want to make this a good experience for you all. 
And I know there's a massive delay between the time I say something and the time you can see it, so just bear with me. Okay, I'm going to wait about uh, 30 more seconds because I know the delay. And if it turns out where there's no questions, that's fine. I'm seeing some cloud architect, which basically means people are still here. Please let me know. Um, 60 plus people. I expect lots of lots of cloud architects. If you guys are here, awake, alert, and oriented. So if I see people are awake, alert, and oriented, and they're not asking questions, I will keep moving on to new, fresh content. Just be, want to be completely, completely sure. Um, everybody's okay. I'm saying I'm awake. Cloud Architect John, thank you for letting me know. It's really hard talking about DNS. It's one of the more dry things. Um, DNS is exactly like medicine. You definitely need. Alonzo, you are completely right. Ian, just go through DNSSEC again. We didn't go through DNSSEC in the first place, uh, Ian. Um, so, uh, I'll make sure that if you desire us to go through Ian, Ian desire to go through DNS, um, since you're one of our students, we'll do some DNS sec internally. Um, it's not part of the AWS course. The reason it's not part of the AWS course is AWS didn't even support DNS sec until very, very, very recently. Okay, how could you resolve records? Some dude, that's really great. I'm thrilled to hear you're actually enjoying learning DNS. Um, it's actually a very, very important topic. It's one of the less fun things for me, but it's something that's so critical. So let's do that. So there is a, a second kind of DNS. Um, so there's AWS Route 53, which actually is involved in, traditionally speaking, mapping a name to an IP address for an external facing website. Now, there are times, for example, where you want to be able to use uh, uh, AWS DNS names inside of your data center and things like this. So what's going on is there's two kinds of DNS. There's Route 53 for your websites, and there's something called EC2 DNS. Now, when you set up an EC2 instance in the AWS cloud, what's going on here is I'm doing that right now. Um, oh, so when you're setting off, um, so when you're setting, when you're when you're basically just setting up your your DNS environment with, with well, I'm sorry. So DNS, we're going to say Route 53. But when you're dealing with AWS and you set up some EC2 instances, have you ever noticed they have a fully qualified domain name there? Well, when they have a fully qualified domain name, um, realistically speaking, what's actually going going on with your fully qualified domain name is as follows. You, uh, you can connect to them via their DNS name, but let's say you want to access that through your corporate data center. You can basically use something called Simple AD. And what you can do is you can basically use Active Directory-like services and this means your on-premise systems will be able to point to the simple AD that exists in your AWS cloud. And by doing this, systems in your data center will be able to access the Route 53 D, I'm sorry, the EC2 DNS. So I think that was the question that was asked. How do you integrate your, your normal environment with this? Is realistically speaking, you would use something called simple AD and over your direct connection, then you could basically use your direct, your, you could use your data center which would connect through simple AD, which would then connect to the EC2 DNS, and then the users in your data center could use the fully qualified domain names in your EC2 environment. I think that's the question that was asked, and that's how to do that. Regarding alias and non-aliases, that's not something I work with. I don't want to give you improper information. I am a infrastructure person is an infrastructure person I focus on routing and switching and servers and load balancers and firewalls 
Typically speaking, your sysadmin people are much more related to DNS, and that is not my area of expertise to basically give you the extreme limitations. I will tell you, up until about six months ago, if you had a real environment where you needed security, you just couldn't use AWS DNS at all. So until six months ago, it was Route 53 wasn't even the list of possible services for me and every other cloud security architect in the world because they didn't support DNSSEC. Now that AWS supports DNSSEC, it's pretty much a regular DNS environment and you can use it for pretty much anything. So six months ago, cloud architects like me didn't even consider it because of the security problems. Now, since AWS has DNSSEC with Route 53, it's totally appropriate to use. There's no major limitations that would preclude you from using AWS DNS at this point like it used to be. But, you know, that's, I don't specialize in DNS. I specialize in infrastructure architecture. But at this point, Route 53 is fully functional. Six months ago, the answer was it was totally not by any stretch of the imagination. Let's keep moving on unless there's, let's keep moving on. So, where do we stop over here? Let's, at this point, we talked, uh, so let's talk about the AWS implementation of Route 53. So, let's talk about it. So, Route 53 is the AWS version of DNS in the cloud. So, it's designed to give the users what's considered to be, you know, low-cost DNS services. Now, because Route 53 is just a DNS service, but it's AWS's, it's just AWS's. So with this, you can basically route, you know, your traffic inside of your AWS resources or outside of your AWS resources. It's just DNS, just the AWS name. Of course, they have to give it a complicated name like everything else. Now, Route 53, you know, makes sense because DNS uses TCP and UDP ports 53. So we can figure out that's how they got the name. I still wouldn't be calling something Route 53 because, you know, now it's like a highway to me and, and DNS just maps a name to a highway. It's not exactly a routing service, but, you know, who am I to name these things? So Route 53 is just DNS. You can use it the way you would use any other service to, re to register your domain names. Now, you can register your domain name with AWS, great, or you can take a domain name that you purchased somewhere else and you can transfer it to AWS. So when you're going to be purchasing, you know, a new domain with Route 53, the service is automatically going to configure a hosted zone for each domain. And, you know, one benefit of at least using Route 53 as opposed to other DNS providers is when you, when you set up your domain registration, you get privacy protection and they don't charge you from who is at no cost, which is great. If you don't have privacy protection, people will know all about you and the people that did it and possibly even your phone number. So privacy protection is generally a good thing. Normally you would pay for this. AWS gives it for you automatic when you use Route 53. When you use Route 53, you've got a lot of top level domains. It's not just .com, .edu, or .co, or .uk. There's about 150 of them. Now I mentioned you can purchase it directly from Route 53 or you can purchase from somebody like GoDaddy and transfer. Now when you're transferring domains through any different provider, this stuff has not the easiest thing to do with regards to transfer. I mean, there's always work along the way. So there's prerequisites to transferring a domain. So you got to remember these. If you register the domain and you want to transfer it, it's got to be at least 60 days old. If it's not at least 60 days old, it's going to be really hard to transfer domains. If the registration for the name has been expired, then again, you're going to have to restore it at least 60 days before you move it over. So transferring a domain, you know, everything has to be perfect. 60 days old, can't be expired, that kind of thing. If it's expired, you're going to have to restore it and then restore it and then wait an additional 60 days. So just remember that. When you're dealing with a domain and you're going to transfer domains, this is specific to Route 53, but it's pretty much standard everywhere. You can't have any of these things that say like client transfer prohibited or pending delete, or your domain can't be pending transfer. It can't be in the redemption period. Server transfer can't be prohibited. So you're really dealing with making sure that you're not having anything that precludes you from transferring your domain. That's kind of pretty important there. So just remember that. Now, when you're dealing with Route 53, it's a little different. Typically with DNS, you've got a zone file, but 
When you're dealing with AWS, you've got something called a hosted zone, just basically a zone file. And what is the hosted zone in AWS? What it really is, is it's a collection of records that for simplicity could just be managed together. They're going to belong to the same parent domain. And when you're dealing with this, all resources and record sets inside of a host domain must have the hosted domains as a suffix. So, for example, when you're dealing with something like this, GoCloudArchitects.com hosted zone may contain the records www.gocloudarchitects.com and training.gocloudarchitects.com, but this would all include a record name gocloudarchitects.com. So, we talked a whole lot about all these record types and all this academic stuff, and you know, that's the hard part. Now, let's get to the fun part. The part where it's cool, the part where you can do something with DNS, the part where you can make it use it. So here's where the policy, this is the fun part, now that we're past the economic part. We're going to talk about simple routing, weighted routing, latency based routing, failover based routing, geolocation based routing, multi-value answer routing, and geoproximity routing. And while none of this is as fun as BGP, because I love BGP, especially AWS BGP, but BGP in general, we're going to have a ball with this AWS DNS work. So let's begin with simple routing. Simple routing, very simple maps an IP address to a DNS name. What is the IP address for GoCloud Architects? That's it, maps it. So standard, one address, one name. Perfect, perfect, perfect for a simple and elegant solution. Now, let's say you've got a more sophisticated web environment to me. I've got a set of web servers, that's it. I don't need any more than that. But let's say I had something complicated. I might need something different. Let's talk about the weighted policy. Weighted DNS is really cool. You know what a weighted DNS policy is? It gives you the ability to specify where your traffic goes. Send 90% to this server and 10% to this server. Hmm, where does that seem applicable? Imagine you want to try a new website. Imagine you want to try some new server, some, a new, a new, a new, some new things on your web page. Imagine having two versions of it. Send 90% to the old established one that you know works great. Send 10% to the new one. And if everything works great on the new one, switch everybody to the new one. Hmm, like a blue-green deployment. Weighted routing, perfect for this. Send a certain percentage to one thing and a certain percentage to another one. Simple, beautiful, elegant way to upgrade migrate your path. Part of DevOps, part of lots of environments. Weighted routing, beautiful. Let's talk about some other policies. Let's talk about latency-based routing. What is latency-based routing? It finds you the web server with the lowest latency. How cool is that? Lowest latency, best performance. I don't know about you, but I hate waiting. So lower latency, better interactive performance. So latency-based routing allows you to direct traffic based upon the lowest network latency in the region where you're accessing it. What's it going to do? It's going to figure out where you're coming from by your source IP address and then give you the server with the lowest latency. Awesome, as a load balancer with the lowest latency. That's how latency-based well lines work. What about failover? This is simple. You create two websites. Website one fails, go to web server two. Perfect. How does this happen with a health check? What is a health check? The DNS system is saying, are you there, web server? Are you there, web server? Are you there, web server? And the web server says, I'm here, DNS. I'm here, DNS. I'm here, DNS. I'm here, DNS. And if the health check says, are you there? And the server doesn't answer. And the health check says, come on, are you really there? And the server doesn't answer. And the health check says, are you there? And the server doesn't answer. DNS says, wait, the web server's probably dead. Let's get rid of this and let's switch over to the other one. So that's your failover routing. So let's review these as we go along because I want to make sure you don't forget them. Simple routing maps a name to an IP address. Rated routing said 90% here, 10% here. Latency-based routing figures out where you're at, sends you to the server with the lowest latency. Failover routing, if your primary server goes down, send you to a backup server. Now, we've covered the main components of DNS so far. So while we're having fun with it, let's go to geolocation routing. Geolocation routing is cool, too. Geolocation routing will look at where you're at and send you to the website that's the closest to your users. Hmm, where could this be useful? Determine your source IP address and send you to the website that makes most sense. Let's look at the continent of Africa, for example. English, French, and Arabic are your primary major languages. 
wouldn't it be cool if you've got a, a web a person that starts in Ghana, for example, and it's primary, and, and let's say this French is the language that's being spoken, of course, English is widely spoken as well, and you can see the source IP address from someone in Ghana and send them to a French website. By comparison, maybe you want to send somebody to an Arabic website by assuming their source location, or somebody basically in Nigeria, you want to send them to an England-based website based upon the primary language spoken there. All of this you can do with geolocation routing because you're going to look at the source IP address of the person, where they're coming from, and then you're going to send them to the appropriate place. So really cool. You could do this in India as well. You could send people in Punjab to a Punjabi website versus a Hindi website for, for another location. It gets really cool. Figure out your users coming from and send them to a custom tailored website based upon their location. Fantastic. The next kind of DNS is, uh, I view this as random, I don't like random, multi-value answer routing policy, and basically it's like simple routing where you just have, basically it's like rolling the dice, you know, which, which one of the web servers you're going to go to each time. I don't like random. I hate random. I want to know exactly what's going to work and how it's going to work. I don't use any kind of multi-value answer. I always have a policy and I know what it's going to do and I design architectures where I know how they work. I don't know these auto magic things where it just happens and you have no control. Auto magic, not a great way to design anything, but you know, it's an option. Now there's this concept called geo proximity. What is geo proximity? Geo proximity is basically going to let Amazon route your traffic based upon whatever geographic location it thinks is best based for your resources. And what happens is basically you're going to be working in an environment and it's going to be dividing the world into geographic regions, as you can see here. I borrowed this picture directly from Amazon and we've cited it over here. Basically, you've got your regions. And what you can do is you can set up these biases in geoproximity and, and that'll shrink certain environments and that'll send your traffic to different places. So geoproximity is a type of thing based upon, you know, geographic areas. It's just something to keep it, pay attention to. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the Route 53 resolver. You know, in a normal environment, you've got some on-premise DNS devices. And Route 53 resolver really makes it easy for the hybrid clouds users um, to basically enable like a seamless DNS query kind of work across the entire cloud. So the Route 53 re resolver will allow customers to basically conditionally forward their DNS requests from their VPC to their on-premise DNS server. So that's the way the Route 53 Resolver works. And the Route 53 Resolver includes the Amazon DNS server information, which is publicly available in all VPCs and all records. Now, the health check is really important. I know I keep talking about health checks and the concept of BGP Keep Lives. I talk about you know, health checks in the context of of DNS, you know, are you there, are you there, are you there with the response, we're going to be using middle of the balancers as well. So really what's going on with this Route 53 and the health check is quite as well. DNS is just checking the server and see if it exists. If it exists, you can see we're represented with a green arrow. If it does not exist, we get a red X, meaning it's not there anymore. So we've now covered DNS. And we're going to have fun talking about some load balancers, which is a much, much, much more fun topic than DNS. But we beat the DNS horse down for a little while. So prior to moving on, let's make sure that you're all awake, alert, and oriented times three. What do I mean by awake, alert, and oriented times three? It's a medical prescription. Do you know where you are? Do you know the date? That kind of thing. So hopefully you're all there. And that's why I keep asking you to type in Cloud Architect because it's cool and it's fun. And I like being a Cloud Architect. So ask some questions and then we'll get on to the load balancing world. If you've got any questions and if not, you know, it's time for me to just babble and I'll go back to the load balancing world. Eric, the fact that you are here shows me your adaptive, your ability to adapt, improvise and overcome. And I know where you've achieved those really magical skills, Eric, and we are thankful to have you in any way that you're here, Eric. So proud of you for being here. Um, realistically speaking, given the current challenges that you're describing, which I won't talk about, super proud of you for being here. That's the heart of a warrior. That's the heart of a lion. When you are done with your challenges, 
We've got huge plans for you, Eric. Huge. Thank you for letting me know, Bellwinder. Cloudy Architect, Ian, I got you on that one. Uh, <laughs> DNS can make all of us cloudy. Good job, Sarah Smith. Love it. And thanks for working with me as I'm trying to make this a little fun. When we're talking about, you know, cloud stuff, some of it's really fun and exciting. Some of it is not. So I want you to know it all because and, and we get through things like DNS, which are on the challenging side. Thanks for fighting through it with me. I'm very grateful. You guys are doing fantastic. Truly fantastic. So, questions asked for me to cover Route 53 Resolver a little bit more. I'll do it again. Great question. Route 53 Resolver is really going to be the equivalent of Route 53 for an on-premises virus, meaning the data center. So, Route 53 Resolver is really about making hybrid clouds easier for enterprise customers by enabling DNS to pass through the hybrid cloud. So, when you're dealing with the Route 53 Resolver, it's to allow customers to forward their DNS requests from the VPC to your on-premise DNS server. So it's connecting the two. And then uh, basically speaking, you know, Route 53 Resolver includes the Amazon DNS server, you know, Amazon provided DNS, which is available by default on all VPCs. And it's gonna respond to DNS queries from AWS resources for all public records, all Amazon VPC specific DNS names, and Amazon Route 53 private hosted zone. So that's kind of what the DNS Resolver does. Gopal, thank you for letting me know. Um, Theo, awake and amazed. You are um, wonderful. Super happy to hear that. Um, some of that stuff is super exciting and really fun. Um, so now that we've covered this, is there any more questions prior to going to load balancers? So we will cover load balancers today and we'll see where we end up from there. But we definitely want to cover load balancers. Going to make sure everybody gets a great, great, great cloud computing and cloud networking experience. So let's talk about load balancers. And though load balancers are not typically considered networking and they're not typically in the world where network architectures like uh, architects like me work, network load balance or load balancers in general are really, really, really awesome. Um, and thank you so much, our own offer of talking about our classes. We really work hard to make sure we do everything we can to make sure our students that we bring into our cloud architect career development program learn a lot, become great cloud architects and get great jobs. Chris from my team can make sure you've got access to the link of the program along with the coupon code as well as a phone number to access our organization if you desire while I cover load balancers. But thank you so much, Arun. And thank you, Tyrone. Tyrone, I've, uh, are you my student, Tyrone, in South Africa? Because if so, I haven't seen you in a couple of weeks, and I'm thrilled you're here. If you're another Tyrone, welcome. We're thrilled to have you as well. So let's talk about load balancers. What is the purpose of load balancers? This is one of those interview questions I ask people. And this will give me an understanding of what someone really knows what a load balancer is. A load balancer is a device to improve the performance and the availability of the network. That's what it is. It is a device to improve performance and availability. And we'll tell you why, but understand that's the function of a load balancer. Improve performance and increase availability. A load balancer is simply a device that's going to distribute traffic, whether it be network traffic or application traffic. Load balancers can help enormously with scalability because they allow an application to be deployed across multiple servers. Think of it this way. No load balancer, single server. If you have the biggest, biggest, biggest server in the world and it failed, you're done. So remember the military average. One is none, two is one, and three is better than two. What do we mean by that? If you've got one, it will fail. If you've got two, it's probably going to fail. And if you've got three, you're probably going to stay up. So load balancers enable you to use multiple servers. Even, even if you wanted to buy the biggest, biggest, 
biggest, baddest servers in the world. They're never going to meet the capacity needs of your, at some point. At some point, you're going to grow past it. So you're going to need a load balancer to distribute your load across multiple servers. And in many cases, it's going to be far cheaper to use a lot of medium-sized servers than a small number of huge servers. Um, so improve performance, improve availability, lots of scalability. So when we talk about scaling, we're going to talk about scaling up versus scaling out. And they're pretty different. Scaling up is bigger servers. Scaling out is adding more to them. When it comes to really performance, you're going to be doing both. You're going to be bigger, more servers, and bigger servers. So, you know, this is the process. So, load balancers will remove your single points of failure. And load balancers do these health checks. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? And by asking, are you there? And the server is saying, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. The load balancers exist. Now, when that conversation says, are you there? And nobody answers. Same way I'm asking all you guys, like a health check. Hey, type cloud architect. Same thing that's going on. I'm doing a health check. I want to make sure that you're all there. I want to make sure that you're listening. Where do you think I learned these kind of health check reliable things? I come from a world where, where basically I, 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 I was a paramedic firefighter for many years. So people like me that work in these environments, um, we find ourselves in this typical environment where we're always doing health checks. If I speak to a soldier on the other end of the radio and I say, meet me at this rendezvous point at XYZ time, they're going to confirm meeting at rendezvous point at XYZ time. So that's what a health check is. Are you there? It confirms that you're there. Critical, critical, critical to do that when you're dealing with high availability, high performance solutions. So now you know that's what load balancers do. Now when we're talking about load balancers, realistically speaking, we're going to be talking about two kinds. We're going to be talking about the network load balancer and an application load balancer. We'll briefly cover the concept of the classic load balancer. And tomorrow, when we start talking about doing things like elastic load balancer sandwiches, or today, we'll talk about the concept of a gateway load balancer as well, which is a newer service. Um, but we're going to talk about all three. Most important thing to remember is that network load balancers are fast, really, really fast. And network load balancers operate at layer four of the OSI model, layer four, meaning TCP or UDP. So network load balancers, TCP, UDP, really fast. Why are they really fast? Not a lot of intelligence. The more you ask a device to do, the slower it's going to be. Network load balancers, fast, fast, fast. High throughput, big servers, big load balancers, network load balancers. Application load balancers, by contrast, Highly intelligent devices. They work at layer seven of the OSI model, like we talked about yesterday. They're looking for little things inside of an HTTP or an HTTPS header. This is deep, deep, deep in analysis. When you do a lot of analysis, you can't do it as fast. Application load balancers, routing between microservices, we'll talk a lot more. Intelligence, network load balancers, speed. What do you need? The application will tell you which one you choose. Now, when you're dealing with AWS, they have both types of load balancers, network load balancers and application load balancers, just like each and every one of these kind of things. So really interesting question there. I'm, uh, we, uh, um, we may have time to do some in the end. So when we're dealing with, a lot, with load balancers in AWS, AWS basically has to come up with a new name for them. So their branded name for everything is Elastic This, Elastic That. So they call their load balancers Elastic Load Balancers. An Elastic Load Balancer is just an AWS branded load balancer, but it's a logical device as opposed to a hardware device. So typically speaking in the data center, a load balancer is going to be this physical server. It may have some ASICs in there. It's going to be really fast and really powerful. Redundant power supplies. These are highly available, highly redundant devices. In AWS, for their stuff, you better believe they're using these big F5 DNS kind of load balancers to load balance stuff in their data center. But the stuff you buy from AWS is an elastic load balancer. It's software. And pretty much it runs on an EC2 instance. It's software. It's a virtual load balancer. Now, could when you and we'll talk about how to use industrial load balancers versus AWS load balancers as well. But the AWS branded load balancers are called elastic load balancers, and for the most part, they work pretty well. Now their load balancers are just virtual machines running in software and they are auto scaling. They're considered to be highly available devices. 
and these highly scalable auto scaling devices, you know, what you have to remember is they are auto scaling computers, which means when they auto scale, what's going on is they're using IP addresses because they're scaling. So make sure when you're dealing with load balancers, which are going to scale up as needed, that you've got enough available IP addresses, otherwise they won't scale up. Remember what we talked about yesterday, AWS reserves the first four IP addresses of a subnet and the last address. So when you're dealing with these logical elastic load balancers in the cloud, just remember that. If auto scaling will occur, multiple addresses will be used. Now I told you load balancers support health checks, and guess what? AWS elastic load balancers do the same. And AWS load balancers can do something really cool, which is terminate an SSL connection. So typically speaking, when you're doing HTTPS connections to a web server, for example, uh, HTTP connections to a web server, what's actually going on is these HTTPS connections to the web server get terminated on the web server. Now, anytime you're running IPsec encryption or HTTPS encryption, it uses a lot of CPU resources. So because of this, because you're using CPU resources, which is what's going on with your load balancers, I mean, to do, uh, terminate your encryption, if you can terminate your SSL directly on the load balancer instead of the, the web servers, you can reduce the load on your web servers. So by the load balancers terminating your SSL connections, they can greatly enhance with your, your, your scalability of your, of your systems and enhance the security of them. So remember, AWS calls their, their load balancers elastic. They come in network flavor forms, and they come in, uh, in uh, application forms. And they use auto-scaling. They use IP addresses. Remember that. And they can terminate SSL-based connections. Now, let's talk about the network load balancer. Fast. That's what you remember. Millions of requests a second. Perfect with rapidly changing patterns. And guess what? The connections are stateful. This is really awesome. Which means by the way the flows are mapped, if you start your session with server one, and the next session goes to server two, and the next session goes to th server three, they stay on the same service until the connection's over. So it's not like you're going to be tearing up and setting up and tearing down connections every single time. So they're stateful connections. Now, it layer four with these network load balancers, this is automatic. It happens via something called sticky sessions, which provides a mapping of source and destination of the connections. Because it's occurring at layer four, this happens automatically. It's natural the way network load balancers work. So sessions stay um, between the, the user and the server. It works really wonderfully. Now, when you're doing these network load balancers, typically speaking, you can put a static IP address on, on it. And you're definitely going to be typically doing that when you're dealing with an externally facing web, access, web address. So let's uh, look about what this load balancer environment typically looks like. Typically speaking, you would have your, your load balancer and it would, it would load balance between your EC2 instances or your services. Do your network load balancer, application load balancer do this? Now I see the questions popping up. Let's answer this question again. Network load balancer. Super high performance. Choose a network load balancer when you need speed and performance. Network load balancer likes the flow based upon TCP or UDP or ICMP, but it wouldn't be really load balancing ICMP traffic. That's what you're using a load balancer for. Fast, fast performance. Millions of transactions for a second. So... That's what a network load balancer does. Now we're going to talk about an application load balancer. An application load balancer, by comparison, is a much more intelligent device. Because it's a much more intelligent device, yo gosh, it's going to be much slower. The more you ask something to do, the less fast you can do it. It's just like anything else. If you just wanted to build a rocket ship, it could be really fast. Now if you wanted your rocket ship to fly in space and then go through the ocean and then drive on the car, you to be asking it to do more things, it won't do any of the things quite as well. So it's going to be much, much, much slower, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be great. It's still going to be awesome. So just remember that. So application load balancers work at layer seven. Network load balancers layer four. Application load balancers layer seven. <clears throat> now application load balancers are smart. So they can look at things like the path provided in the URL, 
elements in the TCP header, like, or I'm sorry, in the HTTP or HTTPS header. They can look at the HTTP method routing, for example, push or get, and they can route based on source addresses. So these things, you guys, are really, really, really smart. And they have the ability to basically route in between places. Now, when you're dealing with HTTP or HTTPS traffic, these uh, elastic load balancers, specifically application ones, are great. When you're load balancing among microservices or container-based applications, these things are awesome. When you're load balancing between multiple requests on the same compute instance on different ports, these things are great. So application load balancer, more intelligent. So if you're load balancing between 10 web servers that have 128 cores and 4 terabytes of RAM, and these are big, massive servers, you're using a network load balancer. But if you're dealing with like virtual machines that have two cores on them or four cores and 16 gigs of RAM, and they're doing, you're doing looking in the application header, you're going to look at an application load balancer. So realistically speaking, what you're doing is you're working really hard to find the right load balancer for your application. Now let's talk about a little bit about these application load balancers. I'll show you what they look like architecturally speaking. Got your load balancers, and these things are listening for certain things. So what they're doing is they're going to consistently check. They're going to do a health check. So you're there, are you there, are you there? And they'll remove things that are not on location. And then it will distribute your traffic to the appropriate target group. Target group in AWS is something you just specified. So these are the things. So to make a con to put it into content, um, things that application load balancers support is uh, is the path provided, the elements in the TCP header that are there, the met HTTP method, and basically the source of source address. So that's what your application load balancers are kind of doing. So pretty intelligent devices that can look at things in layer seven. Now with AWS, you have the concept of something called the classic load balancer. Guess what a classic load balancer is? Just a load balancer that works in, a, in an older version of it. Again, because it's a load balancer, it's going to be an application load balancer or a network one. And it's going to work in pretty much the same way as any other load balancer. It's just a different one. AWS recommends using an elastic one versus a classic one. We're going to follow those recommendations. Understand it's just a load balancer. Now, this is a pretty important concept. When I, when I speak to students, when I interview people, they struggle with this concept. Concept of an external versus an external load balancer. External load balancers are what most people think about. They're basically your internet-facing load balancer. Load balancer has a public IP address on the outside. It has a default route to the internet gateway, connects to the internet, and your systems are available from the internet. External load balancer. But not all applications are on the internet. Organizations have internet or internal networks. They might even have internal websites that they don't want available on the internet. And for that, they would use an internal load balancer. External load balancers or internet-facing load balancers are public for the internet. Internal-facing load balancers, by comparison, are for an organization internally. So now you know the two kinds of load balancers, internal versus internal, external. Now there's a lot of things that need to be done when you're dealing with, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to stop here for a couple of minutes and, and, and make sure everybody is good on basic load balancer concepts before we start going into things that are deeper. Any uh, basic uh, load balancer questions so far? Prior to us, continue to keep going. Any questions? Give you guys a minute to see if there's any, any major thing. Um, we we kind of hit these load balancers pretty hard with regards to answering questions. Um, but I just want to make sure. Okay, doesn't look like I see any kind of questions popping in right now. Since I don't see any questions popping in right now, I'm going to keep talking about load balancers. And I did see one from uh, one load one question from uh, that I actually thought was kind of a good one from Amarath, where he asked if I can give some potential interview questions um, and things from a hiring manager's perspective. I am happy to do that in the end if we have time. 
uh, Amarath. Um, I will tell you, we've got 20 students or 20 video, 20 videos on interview preparation on side of our channel, so they're there. Um, since you're one of our students, we do it constantly internally. But if we have any time um, left over towards the end, I will do some interview questions, and I'm happy to do that. And if any of you guys want me to try and figure out a way to do an interview question live stream, let me know, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll do something like that. So. The first question I see from Mr. Sharma, what scenario would you use a network load balancer or an application load balancer? I would use a network load balancer anytime I need a high performance load balancer, meaning lots of requests, big giant servers. I would use an application load balancer when I need less speed, less performance, but I'm looking for something that's a bit cheaper and I'm looking to route between say containers or microservices. That's how I would choose to use them. Harsh, the classic load balancer is just a standard load balancer. Um, it was the original version that AWS made prior to the new naming of it an elastic load balancer. They work the same way. So a classic load balancer is just a load balancer where you can do an application or a network load balancer. It's just an old term. Because it's an old term, it's an older protocol, it's a legacy way. AWS is moving everybody to the elastic load balancer. But very similar, same kind of configuration, very, very similar. Same kind of use cases. I got a good to go from Alonzo. I don't see a lot of questions piling in. So let's talk about load balancers. So, so you understand how they work. If you have to configure them, you definitely need to understand how they work to design them. And you may have to configure them so once you understand, but you definitely need to have to design them as an architect. And you can't design something you don't understand. So let's talk about these concepts. When you're dealing with load balancers, you've got the concept of a listener and a target. What is a listener? A listener is basically a process, and it's going to wait for connection requests. And an application load balancer is going to look for an HTTP or an HTTPS request on ports, you know, 1 to 65535. By comparison, a network load balancer is not going to be looking for HTTP and HTTPS requests. It's going to be looking at a TCP or a UDP or a TLS or a TCP UDP request, again, from ports 1 to 65535. Listeners listen. Application, HTTP, HTTPS, network load balancers, basically TCP, UDP, because they're at layer four. And then there's the concept of the target. What is the target? The target's where the load's distributed. So where are you typically distributing your load? Typically speaking, across your compute platform, which is your EC2 instances. So a target can be a compute instance or an IP address. Now, if you're going to use an IP address, the IP address needs to be a private address or come from the shared IP address space. So if you're not familiar with these subnets in these spaces, they are as follows. Private IP addressing is specified by RFC 1918. I will pop the link in here because they're the addresses that are the private IP addresses that are specified by RFC 1918. Or if you're going to use a target, the target will work with the shared address space specified in RFC 6598. And you can see it here. For those of you that are network engineers like me, it's very common for you to go to the IETF webpage, the Internet Engineering Task Force website, and look for an RFC. An RFC, or REST Request for Comments, is basically speaking the design of the protocol from the Internet Engineering Task Force. Me and my teams have always been in Internet Engineering Task Force working groups coming up with the design of these standards. And if you want to read the standards exactly as designed and learn everything about these protocols, and you want to know it better than anyone else, you always go to the IETF documents, the RFCs. Here's the great thing about the RFCs. They are 100% completely free, and they specify everything, everything, everything you ever wanted to know about an IP-based service. So let me get this for you. IETF RFCs. So if you really want to become an expert on BGP, for example, or IPsec, or literally learn any of the IETF RFCs. They are all free. And I'm going to prop, drop the link to this here. So now you know. We gave you a little bit of little value-added bonus. So now that we talked about the concept of listeners and targets, let's talk about target groups. When you're configuring your load balancers, you can group your targets together. So basically, you can say, route to a group of these things as opposed to a single one. And that's basically what a target group is. Now, the next concept we want to talk about is something called a sticky session. Now, I told you by default, 
and network load balancer will automatically keep the sessions between one host and another host. That's called the sticky session. Perfectly by the way a network load balancer works, by nature they're automatically going to work this way. But this is different. It's very different environment when you're using an application load balancer. By default, application load balancers don't maintain session stickiness. They route each request to the server with the lowest load. Remember, they're more intelligent. But what if you want to keep the session up? What if you don't want to keep tearing down sessions and building new sessions every time you go to a new server? That's okay too. You enable sticky sessions. And in order to do that, basically what's happening is the application load balancer is going to do something different. It's going to basically create a cookie and it's going to use the cookie to keep the sessions up and running. So basically that's what you can do. So let's go through some of these concepts on a load balancer with AWS. A listener is where you're listening for a connection request. You're going to look at, for example, TCP or UDP for a network load balancer or for an application load balancer, HTTP, HTTPS. Then you're going to be able to get a target. Where you're going to, where's the load balancer going to send the traffic? That's the target. Now the target group, let's say you wanted to route to a group of targets, that's a target group, and a sticky session is just making sure that your traffic goes from one, stays, maintains on the same server. So I, I mentioned previously the concept of a health check. What is a health check? A health check is simply the way, thank you so much uh, Unix Bash Shell Script, or Unix Bash Script, a health check is simply a way to say, are you there, and make sure you're there, and remove unhealthy services services from the rotation. So these are the kind of things that would need to be done. Now, now we talked about how to do things with AWS. This is where it's going to get a little bit ugly, so bear with me. So, you know, take a deep breath. Cloud Architect, and let's go, because this is going to get a little ugly, so we're going to do it. So, get our, put our thinking caps on. We're going to talk about the concept called an elastic load balancer sandwich. So, this is is. So let's pretend that you are in your VPC and you wanted a load balancer. And let's say, for example, you wanted a big industrial grade load balancer, the kind of thing you would use in your data center. Let's say you don't want a basic cloud service. You want a fully featured, fully functional, high performance load balancer, something beyond what you'd get with a basic vendor based platform like AWS or Azure. Well, you can do it. So what happens, you want something good, you need high security, you're going to go to the, the marketplace to get some good security appliances. You want a really high-end load balancer with full enterprise features and functions? You're probably not going to use the uh, elastic load, you're not going to use the elastic load balancer, you're going to use something different. You're going to go to the marketplace, you're going to get a vendor proprietary load balancer just like the kind you would get from F5 that you use in the data center. And you're going to stick it on an EC2 instance. So, Whenever you need extreme performance or extreme features, you're not going to get them for the most part in the basic cloud services. You're going to have to get something from the marketplace. I do this in all big global enterprise designs. It's fine. These systems work great. The problem is an AWS Elastic Load Balancer is highly available. It's a logical device. Now, when you put Load Balancer software in an EC2 instance, that is not highly available. If your EC2 instance virtual machine goes down, your load balancer goes down. So that's not a good situation. So when you need to use a high performance load balancer in your VPC or VPCs, you have to do some creativity in the AWS cloud. So the creativity is basically an elastic load balancer sandwich. And typically what an elastic load balancer sandwich is is as following. Pretty much what you would do is, let's say you've got two tiers. You would use an elastic load balancer to load balance in between EC2 instances that are running load balancing software, which would then basically um, load balance. And so you'd have an elastic load balancer to your virtual to your your virtual load balancers, which would then go to uh, which would do your load balancing, and then you'd have another load balancer to basically set up your load balancing. So that's what's called an elastic load balancer sandwich. And really all that is doing is you're using a load balancer to balance between your load balancers and then you're load balancing again. Now this is ugly and that's why I took a deep breath and I said everybody take a deep breath and say cloud architect. This is ugly. I mean truly ugly. So what is the new more modern way to get around these elastic load balancer kind of concept? 
AWS has recently come up with something called the Gateway Load Balancer. And a Gateway Load Balancer is designed to load balance between appliances such as firewalls, IDS systems, these kind of things. So in the modern world, instead of using an elastic load balancer, you can use a gateway load balancer to load balance between appliances. So understand when you're doing these AWS solutions, stuff's easy. But when you need higher performance, and you will need higher performance, and when you need some tunability and some feasibility, you're going to have to go to things outside of the AWS basic offerings, and that's an example of the load balancer. So it is 2.43. We have 17 minutes left of the class, which gives us a couple of options. Option one is first, I want to take questions. Option two is Amaranth had a question. If I could give you guys some, some interview questions, which I am more than happy to do. Let me see the questions first. Load balancer support protocols like HTTP, HTTPS, and things that are inside of the uh, inside of the message header. Those are the types of things you'll guess that are covered by a, an application load balancer. Start thinking of microservices. Start thinking of containers. Start thinking of the things in the HTTP, HTTPS header. Yes, Alonzo. AWS is really great for creating another service to another service and another service. Sometimes the new services have new features. Sometimes these new services are just ways to work around limitations, which is still good. And sometimes there's a new service to make a service that we were previously working around with a lot less complex. And sometimes a new service is something really cool, like making adding DNS side to DNS so that we can finally use it. Do load balancers support protocol tunneling? I've never used it that way, oh gosh. When I use protocol tunneling, I do all that on routers and switches where the routers where they're designed to be done. These are specifically purposed hardware that are designed to do tunneling protocols like encryption and IPsec and GRA. So with AWS, there's a concept of a gateway load balancer that you could potentially load balance between routers doing these kinds of things. But uh, it's really going to be an ugly, ugly, ugly solution. If you want to do transporting one protocol on top of another, use a router. That's what it's designed for. What Yo Gesh is asking for is tunneling. When you want to tunnel, you've got lots of ways you can tunnel things. You can tunnel, for example, a packet inside of a GRE packet. You can put a layer, you can you can tunnel basically layer two over an IP on the MPLS space network. Tunneling is when you take one thing and you stick it inside of something else and you transport it that way. So yes, um, that's not where I'd be doing the tunneling. I would be doing the tunneling on some other device. Uh, Mr. Sharma, HF in introduced the network load balancer for microservices and containers and APIs. I am not an application architect. I'm a cloud architect and an infrastructure architect. So I don't really route, do anything between microservices. Yes, network load balancers can do things between microservices. Why are we even talking about load balancers and microservices? Here's the thing. Network load balancers fast. Application load balancers slow. So they're trying to make, you know, when you need high performance application load balancers just are not an option. So you're going to go to the network load balancer. So anytime you need high performance, think at network load balancer. So all that's going on is they're trying to make you be able to do things with the network load balancer that the application load balancer do. Application load balancers are not great at high performance environments. So anytime you look at it this way, and this is the only way I think you need to think about it. Routing between microservices, normal stuff, you're looking for cheap. Application load balancers, they're cheaper. You need higher performance network load balancers. That's pretty much what you need to know about load balancers as an architect. Who else has a question? So if there's no questions, I think uh, Amrath had asked a question or two.
Well, Amrath, I'm thinking about your question about how I could potentially present um, some AWS interview questions in a window where people are not in a position to actually answer via voice. Um, so I don't know how to do that. Um, on the internet, if you've got some suggestions, I'm amenable to it. Otherwise, uh, I've got about 20 videos that I produced uh, to help you guys all with your interviews. Um, and I'm happy to produce some more of them. I'm always happy to make interview question videos. They're, I've interviewed 5,000 people in my career, so I've got lots of them, and I'm always happy to do them. And I'm happy to do anything I can to make sure you guys are successful in your cloud architecture, in your cloud architect careers, whether that be teaching cloud architecture, teaching you know cloud architect interview skills, solution architect interview skills, or any of those things. But of course, anytime you want to talk about BGP, that's always fun for me too. So to let you guys know while we're waiting, um, we have. Uh, an article we're going to be releasing on BGP in the next week or so that's going to be very comprehensive that you can keep with you at your desk to make it very simple when you have to manipulate BGP policy, perform BGP traffic engineering. It's going to be a document that basically is everything you need to know about BGP from a cloud architect perspective. We're going to release that in the next week or so. So if you want a copy of that, please let us know by typing, you know, cloud architect BGP documentation in the window. There's 65 people on the call. If all 65 of you want it, just let us know by typing that in the window. We'll make sure that we get it. We will have it next week, and we will distribute it to the team. Um, we, did, we listed a list of an interview playlist to help you um, prepare for your next interviews. Derek Ducker, you think YouTube has polls now. What are you referring to the polls for? Um, I'm happy to be interested in some questions. Um, are you referring to polls as in like a, a test preparation kind of thing for multiple choice? If you're referring to interviews as a reason I, I don't want to do that. So Derek Ducker, the real challenge when it comes to interviewing potential cloud architects is while I wait for other people to respond for these things, um, please let me know if you want this BGP documentation to write Cloud Architect BGP documentation. There's 60 some people on the call, so if it's really desired, we'll make sure that we know by a lot of people letting us know. <clears throat> so while we're waiting for people to do that, the reason I don't want to do interview questions is multiple choice questions as as follows, um, Derek. In the last uh, 5,000 people or so for, that I've interviewed, the problem becomes as follows. I ask a simple technology question and somebody gives me a two-word answer. Now, when I ask these questions and someone gives me a two-word answer, it is impossible to hire that person because I don't know if they know anything. So when I ask someone an interview question, we're always asking open-ended questions because we want to know someone's skill. So if I ask you, for example, what is the difference between block storage and object storage? And I do that all the time because people typically give me the multiple choice answer. Block storage is EBS and object storage is S3 meaningless information for the cloud architect. As a cloud architect, you might literally need to meet with a customer and spend three days talking about their cloud storage environment or their object storage environment. They might have a petabyte of object storage data and you need to know all about it. You might have to entertain an eight hour discussion or a three week discussion just over their storage. And I need you to know that. So when I do the, if I were to do multiple choice interview questions, what would ultimately happen, I'd be perpetuating the problem with one word answers. I asked someone, a very educated person yesterday, highly, highly educated, incredibly smart. And I said to them, because they were asking me about what it would take to become a cloud architect. I said, well, let me assess your knowledge. And I said, what is the difference between block storage, object storage, how it works, and why you use them while well, we're talking about interviews? And the person says, cut it, cut it, cut it. Block storage, EBS volume. It's a local hard drive. Object storage, S3. I said, how does it work? Why do you use them? It went silent. This was a really smart person. Genius, actually. Now, here's the thing. If I ask someone on an interview, what is block storage? And I get an answer, EBS. I can't hire that person. If I ask someone, what is block storage and what is object storage? And this is what we're looking for. An architect is the designer. So we're looking for an answer like this. Object storage is a type of storage area network that takes data and breaks it down into objects. Like when object storage takes data and breaks it down to objects, it does something interesting in that it adds metadata to the objects. 
object storage is flat. It's not hierarchical like other types of storage. And, and Darko makes this explaining to why. But when object, because when object storage takes data and breaks it down and it adds metadata, object storage is very unique because of the metadata. And because object storage has metadata, you can do incredible things with object storage. For example, you can run SQL queries on object storage. You can integrate object storage into the big data environment because it's got the metadata. You can run ETL tools at, on your object storage and then take that information and put it in the data warehouses or create data lakes. Object storage is really great because of that metadata. Now, because of that metadata and the way object storage works, it's only useful for certain environments. Object storage can't really be used by computers as local storage. So if you're going to use that in a local storage environment, this is what you realistically speaking have to do. So object storage is useful for software distribution, release of say large images and things like that. Object storage is not useful if files change frequently because every time a file is modified, it changes something and it creates a new version. By comparison, block storage, for example, is a different type of storage area network that takes your data and breaks it down into blocks. Now, all these, the, when you, when you, because your data is broken down into blocks, it's stored differently. Now, with block storage, your, your storage can be stored anywhere in the right away or the compute environment where it's efficient. Therefore, block storage effectively decouples the storage environment from your compute environment. Block storage is highly useful, for example, in environments where your storage changes frequently. Because block storage can work with rapidly storaging environments, you can use the things to even store like an operating system. And I would expect all of that long before someone even needs to mention the name of an AWS service. That's the kind of depth that's necessary to prove technical competency. So that's what you need to be hired. That is architecture knowledge. Because if you know that, then you can have the discussion with a client. OK, tell me about your storage. Let me see what it looks like. This is how I'm going to migrate it to the cloud in the same way or in a better way. That is architecture knowledge. So that's why, Derek, I, wasn't, I was trying not to use a multiple choice kind of question because I need to do it verbal like that. And I know you were giving me good options. And I am really grateful, Derek, for the good options. It would have been a good option to use in an interactive way to provide like some competency type questions. And it would be perfect for me to do a certification poll. You know, Derek, I like that idea so much that I'm probably going to run some kind of a multiple choice quiz with some technology, cloud architect things, and then we'll discuss it. I love your idea, Derek. I think it's terrific. But with regards to interview, the problems that I find, because I interview people every, every day. I've interviewed 1,000 AWS certified people. And basically three, I'd be able to hire, but none were really hireable, but three I could have trained. So it's that hard to find a good uh, uh, person. So that's why it's so much important. And just to let you know, like Arun, best way you described it, block storage is the fastest you can get on the cloud, really. But it's slow storage. It's low performance storage. A $100 drive that you can get at Best Buy, an NVMe drive, has a, a hundred, has a million IOPS for 100 bucks. An EBS buy-in, the fastest one you can get, is basically has 64,000 IOPS, which means you need 15 of the best EBS volumes you possibly could put together just to equal what you can get for 100 bucks at Best Buy. So all of these storage environments matter. And that's why as the cloud architect, if you're in the data center, you might be like, you know, this needs high performance, high IOPS. Can't go to the cloud. The cloud can't do it. This can go to the cloud. Cloud architect, move it to the cloud. So realistically speaking, that's why it's so important to understand the why, because as a designer, you need to understand the how and the why to move it over. I hope I made that kind of clear. That's why we do cloud architect training, which is different than certification training, which is why we're focused more on the how and the why, because that's what a cloud architect does, as opposed to the cloud engineer that's building it. So that's why we approach our training differently, because we've worked with cloud architects and we understand. Thank you, Percy. That's exactly why we're working on this. We want you to understand exactly how everything works. I want you to know everything. Because when you know how everything works, then you're going to know exactly which service to use, how to use it, why to use it, and your outcomes are going to be incredible. Fantastic. You guess, you know, the reality is, is this. If you asked me this question six months ago, 
Six months ago, I'd see all these millions of containers that are going everywhere and microservices going everywhere and cloud native everything. If you ask me the same question now, I see lift and shift being predominantly the exclusive things used in the cloud. I see everything in the data center and the cloud being basically just identical replicas, almost pull it straight from the data center and stick it into the cloud. Um, all those cloud native things, uh, they seem to be disappearing um, due to some other things that were actually designed in the industry. So because of some business choices made by a cloud provider, many more of the cloud native things seem to be going away. Um, they are, the cloud native is beautiful. Cloud native is amazing, but there's some architectural considerations that go along with cloud native that a lot of businesses are not comfortable with right now. So what do I really see, Yogesh? I see traditional infrastructure in the cloud. Lift your servers, move them to the cloud. You got a VM in the data center, move it to the cloud. You got a container in the data center, move it to the cloud. Those kind of things. We will definitely produce some BGP documentation. I love BGP. We're talking about AWS. AWS uses BGP everywhere. GCP uses BGP. We will produce you some BGP documentation and we will distribute it next week. Any other questions for me today? Because we want to make sure we give you a great experience. So combining Armraths and uh, Derek Doherty, Doherty's really good suggestions, is there a desire for me, maybe in the next couple of weeks, to really get together and kind of produce a quiz and some cloud architecture concepts and then kind of work it through with the people in the audience in like a multiple choice environment and then give like an essay answer to those things? Is there a desire for that? Because if there is, I'm happy to do so. Thank you, Alonzo. You've been a fantastic student with us. We've seen great things coming from you. And I have big expectations for you and your cloud architect career of the future. Well, what I will do is as follows. I will list a link to our training program, which is the how to get your first cloud architect job training program. I will um, do the following. I will list a link to a 20% off coupon code, and I will leave a link to our office if anybody has any questions. So I see Bellwinder's got some desires for me to do kind of like a technical review. I see Arun has got some desires for me to do a technical review. Um, Alonzo, you like it? I'll do it. Um, JKM, great to be part of your cloud program. Thanks. Uh, great to be part of your program. I'm super happy to have you. Robotics, where do you robotics? Says yes. Uh, Derek, uh, well, thank you so much. We'll definitely do some. Yes, Portia, I will take care of this. Um, we've been designed. Me, I'm the kind of person that likes to do these perfect production values. I film stuff with my professional cameras. We then send it to our video editing team for things. I'm kind of having fun with these YouTube lives. If you guys like YouTube lives and liking me to do more YouTube lives, say more YouTube lives in there. Cloud Architect YouTube lives, pop it in the window. We'll do lots more of them. Anything we can do to help the community, I'm always happy to do it. We love the cloud computing and the cloud architect community. I spent my life as a network architect, and all we network architects started becoming cloud architects, so we love it. Okay, well, I want to thank every last one of you wonderful folks for being here today. It's an honor, I mean, a true honor to be able to work with you, be part of your career development. I have some of the most amazing students from all over the world, and every day is a privilege to be part of this community, part of the opportunity to learn from you, teach you, guide you, share experiences from a quarter of a century worth of work. So, thank you so much, Derek. Um, you guys love the YouTube lives. We're going to do a lot more of them. 
I'm actually having fun with them. So we'll do a lot more. Any last questions or any desires or anything from me before the end of the day? Because I want to make sure everybody's completely fulfilled and happy. Okay, what I'll say is this. Uh, feel free to watch the replay. When this thing gets posted, please share with anybody that you think would be helped by this. Uh, the links in the descriptions of all of our videos have access to free ebooks and other free training courses. Please enjoy them and share them. If you can leave a like, please leave a like. If you're not a member of our channel, please subscribe and hit the bell so you can find out new things. I'm going to do a lot more YouTube lives. Derek, I appreciate everything. Gopal, thank you so much. James, thank you. Guy, thank you. Been really, really, really an honor and a privilege to be with you all today. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Anything with regards to SNMP? That's a great question. Um, you're not really doing a lot of SNMP things going on in uh, the AWS cloud, so we're, we're not really going to cover that in this section. <laughs> SNMP, or Simple Network Management Protocol, is, a, is an old thing that we all used to use to, for the people that are not used to that environment to manage our network devices. But in the cloud, since we don't really have control over our network devices, uh, Ian, glad to see you're here. Um, that is perfect, Theo Q. You should leave each class more and more competent because you're learning each time. That means, you know, I've done a good job and that makes me excited. Thank you, Tejo. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for 4D Robotics. What a cool name. Thank you, Brenda. Love doing this. It's always a pleasure to have you around, Brenda. Thank you, Tyrone. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Gopal. Suba, so good to see you. Um, and thank you, and thank you, Jay, as well. Thank you, everyone. Super excited about how the amount of fun we're having. I will see you all tomorrow. Take care, everybody.